Hey, good morning. Um, I would just uh, like to start if you <laughs> if you stop the networking for two minutes. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you again for everyone's attendance yesterday and especially today. Um, we started with the workshops last year with the main objective um, to create a collaborative platform. Um, it's obviously a bit of a new territory for us. Um, and we adapted a bit from what we did last year because last year was very loose ended um, and very last minute. Um, whereas this year we tried to also get it more in line with the overall objective of modern farming. And I think one of the biggest problems um, with, uh, well, one of the biggest things that we try and do with the Maluma Day is we try and convince people not to come here, even the main sponsors, as you noticed yesterday, we don't want them to come here and purely market their product and purely just tell us, you know, our grand or this or that. We want to create platforms where they do practical research or they come with practical solutions to what we do. And in that, um, we also want to establish an environment where we as farmers or industry, um, you know, people try and improve their products. So it's about uh, collaborating and working to something custom fit for the other industry. It's too often that you find products um, in the apple industry and they bring it to the avocado industry and they say but it's working for the apple industry so i don't mind whether it's working for you or not but that's the way it's it's supposed to work and they say well i need to adapt it a little bit and they say no this is the way it is uh, it's too expensive to change and that's one thing that we don't like we feel that as a avocado industry and the way that we are developing and the size that we are developing to we need more and more custom fit products, whether it's spraying tanks, whether it's uh, tractors, whether it's online programs or computer programs. So I think in terms of modern farming, um, you know, one of the biggest buzzwords at the moment is precision farming. Um, there are more buzzwords such as efficiency. Um, and a lot of these terms are thrown around very loosely. And I think in in my opinion, um, precision farming at the moment is drawn up to a point and then it starts to become too difficult. So what we're going to do now today is to start off and um, I, I tried to warn both of these companies but apparently it's a bit of a sensitive issue. Um, they are competitors if you would like to call it so but I also don't believe there is something such as competitors. I, th I believe purely that people should work together, um, the same as we are working together here as avocado farmers. At the end of the day, we need to improve the total products. Um, the same way that there are people in this room that present different uh, fertilizer companies, etc., etc. So for me, the ultimate aim is what product do we apply specifically to the avocado farmer? That's the important thing. So um, I think we already started a bit late. Just the one thing that I would like to encourage is um, this is not a formal uh, day like the Maluma Day. We do like to encourage people to ask questions. If you want to stop someone, please put up your hand, ask them the question. Um, or if you want to keep it until the end and we have an open discussion. Um, but I really want to encourage you to make notes, um, ask the questions you want. This is your opportunity to speak directly to the people in industry and see where we can go within the next few years. Um, so the first one, obviously, let's look at uh, the way that agri-tech innovations get involved. Um, and I see they reframed it a bit to decision farming, which I quite like. Um, and let's see, thank you. Thank you, Zander, for the opportunity to talk, to talk here today. Um, I'm going to talk to you about decision farming. So there's a lot of talk about precision farming, and precision farming is in the industry already for 
between 12 and 15 years. But the main thing, what a lot of people is asking, now I've done precision farming, what, but what do I do with it? So we start to look more into precision farming, but go into the, into the direction of decision farming. And I'm going to give you some examples today of the precision farming. And then I'm going to take you guys to a platform that we develop for the industry. Um, Agritech Innovation is a company that's quite involved on, in, in uh, most of the fruit industries of South Africa. So um, I'm going to take you through some information here. So the first thing these days is almost everything is georeferenced. If you walk around with your, with your smartphone and you went into an orchard or you drive around with a tractor or you sit somewhere with your laptop, many of the stuff is already georeferenced. So what can I do with all this data? I can tell you one thing, we're sitting with farmers every day and there's a lot of data available currently, but it's all in cupboards or it's on the computer files, it's everywhere around, but nobody is doing anything with this data currently. And if you start to extracting these data, you really get some very interesting trends that is currently out of your own form, it's information out of your own form, but you get information out of that that most of the time is totally different than you thought beforehand. So the main thing is, but most farmers don't want to sit and look into data every day. So how can we take the data and make it more relevant to you guys? So if you look at, at the map like this, this is about a thousand hectare fruit farm, and this is a Google map, just showing an area where it's planted. But suddenly if I do soil classification, I've got a blueprint of this farm, and I suddenly understand what type of soils is on my farm. So it's almost like you don't have the plan of a factory to farm on that factory, but you don't know what's really underneath the factory and how do you going to take it forward. So if you look at all these different soil types, it's a thousand hectare farm, it's got about 50 different soil types. So some of these soil types is perfect for citrus or avos or apples and pears, and some of them doesn't perform at all. Or how do I prepare this type of soils? So some people do a rip action, some people come in and do a dull action with a TLB, we're building riches. So if I build a rich, do I really know how to build my rich? How deep can I go into the soil? Because what we see is the guys are building rich, a rich on a Wesley soil type. It's a soil type that has a lot of clay underneath. He throws that clay on top of the rich, and suddenly we got a problem. We start struggling with phytophthora. And we don't understand why. We think it's the irrigation, etc. But it actually was the preparation of that orchard beforehand and understanding how should I actually prepare it before I start planting. So if you look at this, this specific farm, it's got oak leaves, it's got tukulus, it's got low valleys, it's got pine dens, and all of that soil's got a different characteristic. So if I understand my soil type, I start eliminating a lot of problems in my orchard. So we start with soil classification as our first layer. If you look at these ty two types type of soils, most of the people look at the picture and say, no, it's, it's almost the same. But if you look at the difference in that picture, this soil over there and to this soil over here, this soil's got a much lower potential than that soil almost look the same. Over here you will have a ridge, but that ridge I can't go higher than, you can't take more than 20, cent 20 centimeters of the topsoil, then suddenly you're going to take so some of the subsoil and you're going to start running into problems. I can promise you if you take the subsoil, you will have phytophthora problems in that specific area. It's a given. So you need to try as far as possible to prevent that. If you look at this picture, what is wrong with the picture? Where the two oranges are is where the dripper zones are, and where the hammer is is the area where there's no water currently given to that tree. If you, if, you look at, if you look at that, there's no root hairs there, there's no root hairs there, all the root hairs is in the middle. So one of the big problems over here was a sodium problem in that specific area. So that trees started to struggle just because there was no root hairs in the dripping zone. But do I understand how much water 
can my soil hold? Do I know what is the plant available water capacity of my soil? Because that is one of the big things what we see these days. There's a lot of probes, and we do a lot of water shedding, but where do I put my probe? Do I just take a thumb suck and put the probe anywhere? Or do I know where to go and put my probe and get a proper shedling on the end of the day? 70% to 90% of most of the problems in orchards these days is shedling. Mostly over irrigation, not under irrigation. So to understand where to put my probe is giving me a very good indication how should I irrigate. This is an a area of soil, of a soil uh, map from your area. So this is close by. And you can see over here they, they, they're going to develop avocados. All right? So over there we've got a soil that's nice and deep. It's perfect. You actually don't even have to reach it. It's well drained. It's a deep soil. Don't have a problem. Then you go to these blue areas that we call a cut spray. Big problems. Huge problems. The water, if you dig a hole there, you will see the water is standing in that soil. So even if you're rich, you're going to be struggling with phytophthora and avas. Then you're going down to that area, and you see you've got a tukulu, and you've got an oak leaf. Now those two soils is a family from each other. But the problem in irrigated soils is everybody is over-irrigating that tukulu. So if I have this map beforehand, and I can sit with the irrigation developers, we can try to make sure that we don't struggle with that specific area because they normally over irrigate it and normally we're getting all kind of root diseases in that specific area. So it is simple, small stuff that could help you to not pay a lot of school money later in the year or later in the season. For the guys that doing irrigation shedling, I see Yaku is sitting here doing a lot of shedling. If you have a plant available water capacity map and you understand what is the amount of water that your soil can hold between field water capacity and wilting point. That is giving you a very good indication if you start shedding. I mean, there's a difference between the start of the season and the end of the season in terms of ETA and the crop factor that is using water. But your available water capacity of your soil is a very big indicator on what is the frequency, what type of dripper should I use, what type of micro irrigation I should use. So you get a lot of information before you start. You can start with the right system. And you can start with the right amount of taps. Wetness for avos. I mean, one of the biggest problems that we have in avos. So in that area, eight months of the year, it's very wet in the subsoil. So the guys will struggle over there. Remember the cut sprite soil type? Exactly there. Then you see these soils, they're all sixes. So they're also wet. But if you put a proper reach in place, you won't get problems, you won't get phytophthora. And what is the cause of that specific layer that is a problem? We need to understand it. Is it compaction? If you've got an established orchard and you've got a compaction problem, can you do anything about it? Because a lot of these old avid trees on 30 centimeters, 40 centimeters, we've got a compaction layer. Suddenly the potential of the tree is coming down, the potential of the orchard is coming down. Yes, you can. You can definitely do something on that compaction layer. Who of you guys remember a wikkelplug? Remember that? A wikkelplug, you're putting on the side of your tractor, you go underneath the tree, you break the compaction layer, you do a root cut, which is also good. You rejuvenate the roots. Next year, in two years' time, you do the other side of the tree. Suddenly, you get a total new flush. So all the old trees that is already established, that have compaction layers, you can do something about it. I promise you it will have a big influence on your phytophthora problems and your root disease problems as well. And then we give an orchard layout. So how, do you, how should you lay out those orchards? So you, we will give you a row direction where the row should be. We give you irrigation, uh, a drainage line where you should dra put drainage in. We will give you where the road should be. So after this, with the information of the irrigation developer, we could do a proper layout of that orchard that will give the best results in 5 and 10 and 20 years time.
Because if your start is right, your orchard will perform. Let's look at phosphate. So currently we take one sample per orchard, or one sample per two orchard, and what do we get out of that? So if I look at this, this is a phosphate map. So over here the phosphate is above 90 parts per million. Over here the phosphate is below 10 parts per million. On this high phosphate area, I can promise you, you're going to struggle with zinc problems on the average. You're going to see out of your leaf, out of your leaf sampling, you're going to keep on struggling with zinc. You're also going to start struggling with your potassium uptake. So you're going to start struggling with smaller fruit. You're going to have a bigger fruit drop in November if your potassium levels is low. So make sure that this map gives you a lot of information or what is really happening in my orchard? Because we take one soil sample for one or two or three orchards and we do a full fertilizer program according to that. But is that really the true picture that you're getting out of one soil sample? I mean, your fertilizer programs is running high. The input cost on that is high. But if I have this inform information, I can clearly see that is actually the only area that is low in phosphates on this whole block. This is 74.49 hectares. The CEC of the soil, I see there's not a lot of people that are taking the CEC into account. So up there, the CEC is only two to three. So this is the holding capacity of nutrients in your soil. So if you've got a high holding capacity, you do good in terms of calcium, magnesium, potassium, etc. The big problem if is if that is not in balance. We see that more and more. Magnesium is high. A lot of South Africa's water is high in magnesium, especially in all the irrigation areas. If you look at places like Tabazimbi, where the Crocodile River is passing, Limpopo River, some of those guys are putting between 400 and 500 kgs of magnesium per hectare per year, every irrigation season they're putting down. So that is about five tons of magnesium sulfate. So what's, current, what's currently happening? There's a crust forming on your ridge, you will see algae growing, etc. You see your infiltration on your ridges getting lower. There's not a good infiltration rate anymore. And your, and, your, and your soil is losing that fluffiness. And that is all because magnesium is getting too high. To balance your soil, you need to understand what is the CEC of your soil. If the CEC of my soil, I, if, I, if I understand that correctly, you can do a lot of things just by infiltration. Again, that's coming back to root diseases. It's coming back to water efficiency. It's coming back to your irrigation system. Calcium, we all know how important is calcium for avos. Currently, this, this land is at 55 to 60 percent calcium for avos. You want it definitely closer to 68, between 68 and 72 percent. And it's not, it's not difficult to fix or it's gypsum, or it's calcitic lime, or dolomitic lime also have calcium in there. A lot of people think it's only magnesium, but there's a lot of calcium in there as well. So it all depends on what is the balance of my soil. And then we look at the potassium. This potassium is really high. So we can definitely make it lower in your fertilizer program. Remember, potassium is also a salt. So it can also burn your root days. Makes a problem on the end of the day. We give a topography map showing you exactly where the water is running in your orchard. So this is not as accurate as a land meter, but it is, it's giving you a very good indication where the water is running to. Where the arrows is going, that is the direction where the water will run in the orchard. Just to give, this, is, this now is 17.13 hectares. So I want to give you guys the difference between a big area and a small area. So this is a small area of 17.13, and see the differences in these blocks. I mean, this is calcium. You've got a calcium here of 75%, that is getting too high. And you've got calcium here that is between 40 and 55%. So if you, if you harvest here and you harvest there, you don't understand. Over here you start getting a lot of magnesium problems and you're getting a bit of potassium problems, you're struggling with size, and over here, you see you struggle with quality because the calcium is so low. 
these days to measure is much cheaper than your input costs. That is one of the main things. If you look at the magnesium up there, it's above 35%. If you go to that orchard, you will see there's almost no infiltration. The guys gives water. Afterwards, you can still see the trees are still thirsty. Need some more water. Just to rectify this with calcium, you need to lift the calcium, get the magnesium down. Suddenly, you get high infiltration. Your root, root diseases is less. Phytophthora is less. Just, this is just by gypsum and calcitic lime. Then one of the main things that we started to developing is precision pest monitoring. So these days we do a lot of spraying in the orchards. So about three, almost four years ago now, we started with precision pest monitoring. So these traps, the, the scouts go out and they, they do the traps. And in 24 to 48 hours, you've got a map back and tells you my fruit fly or my false codling moth of my red, the red scale this is the areas that I have the biggest breakout. So you can see on this farm, there's not a big problem here. There's a hot spot, there's a hot spot, there's hot spots. So suddenly I understand where should my tractors and my sprayers go first. Because we're running this on a weekly basis. And if you start to look at this in a video, you will see the hot spot is starting a year, uh, just one week later. The area, it, 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 uh, the, the bigger the area is getting, the bigger the problem is getting. So sometimes it starts with a hectare two. A week later, suddenly you've got 50 hectares of problem. If you look at this, let's say this is fruit fly. You can see there's the areas where there's big problems. There's nothing over here. Here you get an indication on how high is your the infestation. And over here you can see a quite a good um, indication on what happened so far in the year. It's going to get more and more a thing to start do precision application with your pesticides. Just to prioritize where to start and where not to start. Then your leaf sampling. So important. So if I know what is my soil type, I understand where should I take my leaf samples. Because the difference between a Wesley, avos that's standing on a Wesley, and avos that's standing on a Hutton, it's quite a big difference that you're going to get out of your leaf sampling just because of the soil type. So now you take a leaf sample on your block and you do all the applications and the full years fertilizer programs just out of that one leaf sample and was just taken on the wrong place. What's happening now? So we give all as well, we take the soil sample of the leaf samples always on a GPS reference point that you can always get back to the same point to take the leaf samples on the same place. I won't say to compare apples with apples, because I understand this is avos with avos. So, but uh, you can compare it much better if you have the same GPS point every time. So this is now in Afrikaans, but just what is important. These days it's getting more and more important to create time for a farmer. That's one of the main things. So you as a producer needs time. So if you have accurate and trustworthy information, you can take a better decision. The format and the information of that, the format of that information is determining the speed that you can take a decision. So the more visual the information you're getting, the quicker it is for you to take an informed decision. It's really important. And the relevancy of that decision determines success. Because if I can quickly, proactively take data into account, and take that data and apply it on my farm, it makes a huge difference. So what is driving precision farming worldwide? There's a growth of about 14, even getting more in the fruit industry because it started in the grain industry. You actually, it's, if you think about it, we've got a way more intensive industry than the grain guys, but it started with the grains, but it's growing quickly in the fruit. If I take, the previous years, we've done about 1,500 to 2,000, maybe 3,000 years of, of, of hectares of classification on orchards. Last year, we did 11,000 hectares, just on orchards. Farmers that's doing precision farming, starting with soil classification on orchards. It definitely gives an increase in yield and quality. It has a big effect on high input cost, because 
I sometimes what we see is guys is giving fertilizers on places where there's no fertilizer needed, and it actually brings the yield down than taking it up. Differential um, application of N, P, and K, and your ameliorants, that's your gypsum and your dolomitic and calcitic lime. Financiers, the more and more the financiers are starting to look in this direction and says, okay, I want to understand what is the sustainability of this specific area that you're going to plant, what is the potential of that area, and then traceability. You guys will see Global Gap is now bringing in that I want to uh, see more and more soil classification, etc., on blocks. So it's getting more and more uh, a thing from the traceability side as well. So this was the tractors about 10 years ago in the grain industry. This, this is the tractors in today's industry. There's a lot of technology coming in. When we started with precision farming, technology is, was really expensive. To have a GPS or a tractor with guidance, etc., it was really expensive. Currently, this is not that expensive anymore. Technology is just getting cheaper. Okay, so what is important of all this information? You as a producer want to see that information on one platform. And I'm going to give you a small illustration on how that platform is working. This, just to give you indication, is on the platform. It's a screenshot of the platform. This is probes. So this is live, your probe readings on your farm. So when everything is blue, the soil is at field water capacity. If the top is red, your top soil is getting dry, your subsoil is still ripe. If it's, if it's red underneath, your, your subsoil is getting dry, your topsoil is still fine. So you, as the farm manager or the owner of the farm, at one glance in the morning, you can quickly see what is my probes like. Where is the probes that I need to concentrate on? This is live data. This currently is live data from Irichek, a scheduling company that we pulls in and we can show straight on a, on a platform for the, for the producers. Then you guys got a lot of normal information. What is your rootstock? What is the type of irrigation? What year is it planted? What year was the cultivar planted or the, or the, or the orchard? Um, is it drip irrigation? Is it micro irrigation? All that information is easy to put on a map. When you sit in front of your computer, you can just click, I want to see how much is my Maluma cultivar, how much is has. How, many is, how much is Pinkerton? And you just click on Pinkerton and it shows you all the areas on your, on your farm where Pinkerton is planted. If you say you want plant density, you click on plant density and it shows you where's the plant density on that farm. Then your leaf samples. How can you get you a leaf map? The leaf map, just to take a sample and try to interpolate it and get to a certain map, it's quite difficult. But if you have your soil types, you can get to a leaf map showing you where's my nitrogen low, where's my phosphate low, where's my potassium low, in what areas or what blocks. And where should I, get, where should I put a lot of attention to rectify that? How many of you guys take uh, growth curves measuring that? through the year, seeing what is the size of your fruit and wha where is the industry standards and where should we go to. So there's a service that we provide to the farmers where we go to specific GPS points, we mark the specific fruits, and we give a growth curve to show you at the specific date, where are you for a specific cultivar against the industry, and it also shows you where you want to be at the end of the year, at a count that's giving you the highest amount of money because at this time of the year I can tend to want still make a difference when I dare the last four five six weeks you can't really make a difference with anything anymore so to get that information it gives you a lot of insight what to do and can I spend a little bit more money to get to a certain fruit size how many of you guys had people coming to tell you to do NDVI flying over with the drones, looking at the NDVI images. We see there's a lot of people that's doing a lot of NDVI images with drones, etc., etc. on this moment. The main thing here is interpretation. If the interpretation is wrong with NDVI, it actually gives you no information. 
and it only shows you areas of stress and no stress. That's where it stops. You need to go into that orchard, to that specific area, and go and see what is the problem. And then the next measurement is started. So this is not a easy, wonderful product, and now you can manage your farm with NDVI. We do a lot of NDVI, but NDVI, the interpretation, and to go into the orchard is way more important than just look at that picture. Just to give you indication, this is for some of the guys flying with the planes and the choppers to give them a spray map where to go and spray for a specific pesticide. So they, don't, they won't spray over the whole blocks anymore. They will go to those areas, do the spraying, especially with, with diseases, etc., that, that you can do out of the air. And they just spray over those areas on their flight plan. That saves a lot of money on the end of the day if you can do that correctly. So what I'm now quickly going to show you guys um, is our platform. And please, this, if you guys got questions, please stop me. But this platform is, we've got on this moment 700 commercial farmers on this platform. They're all using this platform currently. Um, some of them on a small basis, some of them the total farm. But it's a very... If I go there, um, he will just go to a dummy farm. When he clicks on that farm, you will see it's opening up on a specific farm. There it's opening. And you can see there's all this farm's orchards and their boundaries. So if he, if he zooms in, you can see where's all the orchards. You will see all the yellow layers. That is the title deeds. The whole South Africa's title deeds is on this platform. So you can see which part is your farms and where's your title deeds. So that is the different blocks. So now when I want to put on my soil classification layer, you go to the data selection go to your soil classification and there's an index that he can choose from to give his soil classification. So he will go to soil type, click that go to latest Yes, click that on, go back. Go to your night your sodium map. So now, when you click on that, you will see it starts opening all your information on your specific farm. So as soon as, as you have the information on there, and we've got a, then a drill down tool. So when you click on any place on your farm, it will give you all the layers underneath that specific area. So it, it gives you, let's say you go in the drill down, it will give you your sodium percentage, it will give you the leaf analysis on that specific area, it will give you your soil type. We're currently busy with a yield, a yield um, map for fruit. So the main thing on fruit is we don't have machines like harvester, harvesters or combine that's logging maize all the time, how it's harvesting. We are 
quite far in the process now to have a, 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 a product that every time that your picker picks fruit, it starts logging where he's picking the fruit, what area of your orchard, and we can even say what is the amount in different areas of your trees, how much they pick on top and how much they pick on the bottom. So if you look at this, so now the soil classification is showing, so this is live. So if you're going in here, this is all live. You will see all your product and all your maps live on that. So if you put on, you go to transparency, now you can layer your different maps. So if your, your bottom layer is your soil map and your top layer is your sodium map, you can start layering the two over each other. There you can see on the left hand side, the one is the sodium coming through now. The other part is the, is the soil classification map. If you go now to um, the irrigation scheduling, So click on, you want, to see, you want to see now what is your probes doing, what is live there, there's your probes live. So this is live information from that specific farm's probes on this moment. So and if you click on one of the probes, it will open up and there it gives you what is the current status of that probe on your topsoil and your subsoil, the amount of water that is in that pro probe. If you go to the drill down tool, there you go in the D, you click any place there, it gets the information together, and it shows you what is all the layers underneath, because that is what we're seeing more and more. There's more and more farmers that want to understand the calcium-magnesium ratio there is that. The CEC on that specific point is 9.5, the calcium is 79.2. So any place that you click that layer, you will get all of this information out of that. The biggest thing. You don't want five or 10 or 20 platforms to go in every morning. You want one platform that's got all your information. I wanna show you something else. If I, if I go to the simple layers, and I click on that block, is your boundaries must be on? And I click on that block, now I can put in my own information. So you can put in, it's this cultivar, this is when it was planted, what is my row width, what is my plant interrow, what is my plant per hectare, my cut down date. So there's stuff for fruit farmers and there's stuff for grain farmers and veg farmers in there. So all of your information can be on one single platform. The last thing I want to show you guys is if you want to go to another farm, so I'm gonna just quickly jump to another farm, go to Inkel the Boss. So now I'm gonna jump from up here to a farm in the Eastern Cape. So this is how easy we jump between farms and see the information. If I want to see my leaf samples, what I've taken so far for the year, I click on my leaf sampling, I go to there, I said I want to see my leaves. It's searching, you mean just go to the latest. There you can see precisely where in that block those leaves are taken. So all of your information is on this one platform. I just want to show you guys how easy is it to use this platform. Um, like I said, we've got already 700 commercial farmers on this platform. And it's really helping them a lot every morning just to quickly get all the information that you can get technically. We can put on this platform for you guys. Okay, to end off. So you click on the leaf and there's the leaf report for that specific farm. So you can get all the information out of that. Okay, you can go back to the presentation.
So our machines, our tractors, our spreaders, they are seeing this. We, seeing that we can't see this with the normal eye. But if we put any map into a tractor, that is what they start seeing. There's enough variable orchard spreaders on this moment. We're already using a lot of them. Applying your different fertilizers, your different dolomitic limes, calcitic limes at a different rate on certain areas. Your probes is already in the, in the soil. You already do shedling. How could I easily get information out of that? So the last slide, when I'm before I'm ending, is if you think you're too small to make a difference, you've ob obviously never been in bed with a mosquito. So it's it's a lot of time, small information, small information that you get that's making a big difference on the end of the day to you as a producer on the quality and the yield you're getting and to stay cost effective. Any questions? Yes, do. Question would be, the sampling, is that done annually? And is it actual samples? Is that done with a satellite? How do you do soil type, um, mineral analysis, etc.? The soil, the soil classification we do in two ways. Um, normally what we do, if it's an established orchard, we come, the producer is digging profile holes. In the Cape, we're going to eight profile holes per hectare because the, the soil difference is so quickly on each other. Over here, we, we currently do between four and five different holes. Um, there's also, we've got a spiral auger that we're going into the augers or into the orchards, and with that spiral auger, without digging the holes, we can also do the soil classification. And then when it's an open piece of land, we've got a equipment that we call a geoprobe. So it, it, it um, put a, a, a round um, tube into the soil. We pull that tube out, we cut it open, and it gives you an exact profile of that soil. On the soil chemistry side, we do normally on the orchards, but we do a 0 0.5 hectare grit. That one sample is made out of four different samples that we take, that we mix. We normally take a 0 to 30, a 30 to 60, and sometimes it's necessary to even go from a 60 to 90, especially when we do soil preparation beforehand, and if there's no riches being made. So that is all physically being done. We've got a team that's coming out, and they're doing all that that does work and we bring back the maps. So just to confirm it's half hectare blocks for that sampling, my question would be then, um, and it was a good question, let me just think what it was. <laughs> Dude, just to answer on the, while you're thinking, sometimes we even go to 0 0.25 hectare grid, depending on the different soil type, because sometimes the orchards like, some of the other orchards is 0 0.5 and 0 0.3 hectares big, it's almost like the apple orchards in the Cape. Um, and then we even go to a smaller grid. Okay, fantastic. So yes, the, the follow-up question, and that would be, um, how do you determine where to take that sample? Is it based on topography of the orchard? Um, how do you determine where to take that half or quarter hectare sample? So currently what we're doing is we pull a grid over this orchard and trying to get all the different places that we think should a uh, uh, sample should be taken. But when the, when the soil scientist is in the orchards, they can also determine there's places where we need to take an extra one because you see a little dip or you see a little bit, a little bit of, a, of a higher area and you need to take soil samples on those areas as well because there's where normally there's a different soil type. But what we also recommend, as soon as the soil classification is done, you've got a real physical um, soil map. It's a very good indication where to take soil samples as well. With all of your machine, everything, Trimble, Ag Leader, John Deere, Green Star, whatever you have, it's compatible. Yeah, it's definitely compatible. Anybody Any more else? questions? Okay, I'm just going to ask one or two. Um, one thing that I would just like to know is you mentioned row length. Um, yeah, what, what would you say is the average row length that you work on or ideal row length? 
I think one of the main problems, just to put it in perspective, is um, as we move into more slopes, uh, you missed the orchard visit, unfortunately, yesterday. But as we go into slopes, you know, different gradients on the same orchard, and it's a two hectare orchard, um, you sometimes struggle with, you know, the balance between irrigation lines and, you know, manageable rollings and, you know, also fitting that into the slopes with the different roads. So how would you approach such a perspective? Yeah, that's why we started with the soil, soil type. So because the soil type and the irrigation with the slope, with the row length, all of that we take into account. It's, it's sometimes difficult to say, okay, the best row length for a certain area is, let's say, 50 meters or 20 meters or 30 meters. On the end of the day is, can you track the turn at the end? What is your type of irrigation that you're using? How many taps is in there? And also, very important is what is the soil type differences in that row. So to I'm, I'm quite careful because we, we, we're involved in a lot of orchard layouts and you can have this the perfect uh, row direction or you can have the perfect row, row length, but the difference in soil type is so big, you actually struggle to just get your shelling right. So as soon as you have your soil map, it's very, it's it from there, it's quite easy to determine what is going to be the best row length for that specific orchard taking the slope into account. Um, just one thing that I would like to add to that from our perspective, um, we realize the problem partially um, developing now with Backmar as well. Um, not the problem developing with him, they helped us realize it. Um, <laughs> what happened is um, the specific farm that we're on, um, mentioned it yesterday, the slope. Um, basically the top of the farm is at 1,200 meters and the bottom at 900 and it's over a 70 hectare farm. Um, so it's quite a hectic slope, and at the end of the day, you know, balancing with pressure and all these things as well, even when you go into the just an orchard, the effect of the main line and the sub-main lines, um, and the problem is, you know, you start developing it, you speak about one section of that. Um, for example, we asked um, Paul about, you know, what's the maximum angle that drip lines can go up? Um, you know, before affecting the, the irrigation. And never thought about, you know, while I'm putting a row down this orchard, that's where my main line is going to be. I want to force it there because my principle as a farmer is I want the main line on the road. And I start thinking about, okay, well, I need to balance pressure. I need to do this, I need to do that. And that changes the equations. And then into this also comes, you know, price for the pipe. Um, you know, if you're going to a class 12, it's more expensive. You have to break it every time we reach the point where, um, and we couldn't do anything else about it, um, was the route for the main line, um, whether we go straight or in this, in this scenario, the main line actually went, you know, a long way around. Um, we had to put in a brass pressure regulator, and that's, you know, additional costs on the line. So, uh, Paul, I don't know whether you actually want to comment on some of these things. But I feel, you know, row length is, in my opinion, influenced also by uh, labor costs and efficiency of movement, um, and also irrigation, you know, and the limits of that, you know, adding onto soil type. Yeah. Paul, Vinny. It's one aspect you must look at. It's a more holistic approach to see what is the row length, you know. What is hydraulically possible might not be practical every time for you and all in spraying, harvesting, and things like that. So, so there's a lot of factors that, that I think influence that. Um, I think if I can mention a last comment on that, um, and, uh, and that's one of the things that, you know, initially when I said about precision farming and where I feel, you know, uh, let's use the most simple form that it's not maize farming where it's flat land and you know, you almost just move in. Uh, you know, to me that's the one perspective and then there's the other limit. And I, you know, we all fit somewhere in this paradigm. And I think one of the things for me is you almost reach a point um, and we've had this scenario and we spoke about it last night, um, is where once you start developing orchards, it's almost the case that you need to brainstorm, you know, you almost create a brainstorm for every orchard that you develop because you want the irrigation. I, it depends on the complexity, but as soon as you go into these slopes and things, you reach a point where you almost want the, the person designing your irrigation to sit there. You know, you need the soil specialist to sit there. You need this person and you need that person. And unfortunately, a lot of the times, 
all of that knowledge is not located within one person. You know, the same as you can't expect one person to know everything about avocados. At the end of the day, you need all these complexities to come together and to make the most informed decision, it's almost a collaboration between parties. I don't know where how yeah. you feel. Z Zander, to add to, to that, I mean, um, we normally sit around the table with delegation specialists um, because that is, that is one of the most important aspects of the development of that orchard. We're sitting around the table with the horticulturist because that's an important factor. Um, normally the guy that's understanding the genetics quite well because uh, that is an important factor. And then on, on the end of the day, pretty important is, is the farmer that needs to understand what all of these aspects is going to um, um, help him to develop that orchard. But the easy thing on maize is next year I, I, I've harvested, uh, my crop is off the land, and I'm starting over new. We're starting here with a 20, 30, 40, 50. We've got even citrus orchards that's 100 years old. So if, if you can develop this orchard on the correct way, it can give you high yields, good quality for a long period of time. That is when you're making good money out of an orchard. So um, not to pay school fees, fees later. I mean, the most expensive part is if the orchard's already established for eight to nine years, it's not producing quite well, and then you to start try to start fixing, fixing stuff. And that is when uh, it's really going to start costing you money. So we say to the guys, start early, do it before you do the development. Th the cost to to do the measurement is is actually so cheap. We we worked out the other day. It's about 0.1 um, percent of the total cost. So it is it is so low, but you get all this information. The the main thing of soil classification, it's not going to change in the next 50 years. So that is how your s the the way your soil is now. That is the way your soil is going to be in terms of the physical aspects, except when you do your preparation, you do it wrong. Then we call it, you get a Witbank soil type. Now, a Witbank is full of mines, and that gives you an indication why it's a Witbank soil type. I thought it was common soil. <laughs> 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 All right. Thanks, Wanda. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, then next up, uh, New Landis to present the precision farming. While they come up, um, <laughs> I was just thinking about it. I remember well, when I started on the farm, I moved into my uh, grandfather's house. And um, I remember looking through the bookshelves at all the literature and whatever in there and, you know, a few interesting books. And obviously, through the ages, and um, there was a book uh, which, I, if I remember correctly, it was dated more or less in the 60s. And the book's name was just purely Farm Layout Designs, A Guide to Farm Layout. And... You know, it's it's strange. It's something in those days, and it, I, I, thinking back of it, it would actually be interesting to look through that book and see what is actually still applicable, what people started ignoring, because people start ignoring things over time, because they just want to do one thing. Um, but on the other side, also, it would be sometimes good to start adapting these type of things. And, and I, I think, you know, almost precision farming's developed into what the manual is. The difference is now, you know, it's different companies with a different perspectives. And I think somewhere the boots on the ground fits into that picture, and I think that's what we also try and create here. But yeah, thank you very much for joining us as well. Thanks, Ander. First and foremost, um, thank you for granting us the opportunity to be here, and then also complimenting you on a very well organized Maluma Day. We are privileged enough to attend quite a few of sort of similar events, but this one is exceptionally, exceptionally well done. All right, thank you. Because Eric, you look so big and intimidating, we're going to do this in tandem because you want to do it informal as well. Um, now, yesterday, uh, Mr. Stein gave us the message, on the eighth day, God created the farmer. Now, in biblical terms, long before that, on the second day, uh, God separated the land from the water. And he looked over it and he said, it is good. And that's, that's sort of what we tend to say as well. Um, where do we point this? To work? There. It's switched on. <laughs> there we go. There we go. Oh, there we go. All right. So despite all our efforts and our attempts, we owe our whole existence to a six-inch layer of topsoil and the fact that it rains. So down here where... 
fields are irrigated, that's quite a privilege because you sort of get the privilege of, uh, of artificial rain. Now, especially for the, the, the international people over here, I don't know if you've came across this whilst visiting South, Afri South Africa. Pretty sure everybody in this crowd knows this. This is Chappies, right? And they've been around since 1944. And they've been uh, establishing their brand so well that even our South Africans, when we go to a shop to buy chewing gum, even if it's an international brand, we refer to, please can I have a pack of Chappies? But what, what, what's more important about Chappies is on the inside of the wrapper, you get that did you know facts. And this played a very crucial part in the children from since whenever, the 80s and the 90s in our general knowledge and understanding things. So today we're gonna do, just to keep it informal because it's a workshop type of um, occasion, we're gonna throw in some did you know facts. Like, Zander, you talked about the 50s or the 60s. Look at this. Way back when in 400 BC, Xenophon already referred to a uh, man must know the nature of the soil to become a successful farmer. So that was a precision farming concept way back when. And then so we came along and, and, and around you can see when this first GPS was developed uh, um, in 1993, before that was already GIS software coming from that. But the most important date here is 2004, because that's more or less when myself and Yanni sort of got into the game. So we've been around quite a while doing this, and that's uh, obviously that, is, that was revolutionary. In the 1964 Goldfinger James Bond film, that was the first GPS the world ever saw. So that was, that's how, how far we come back. So let's get down to business. The content, um, we refer to ourselves as Newlanders Precision Science Team. Um, we're part of, of, of Newlanders, which I'm pretty sure a lot of you do know. Um, a big, if not the biggest, ag um, ag chemical company in, in South Africa with a big international African footprint. So we're going to talk about today where we fit into an ag chemical company. How does that add up? How does that make sense? Um, and uh, how do we do what we do and what we do? So we're going to focus a lot on, on the practicality practicality and the basics of, of soil science and applying that. Um, and I must admit, Eric, it's, it's good to see that, that the industry is pulling in the same direction. Uh, even though we're sort of opposition, we're, we're pulling in the same direction, so that's good. All right, so this sums it up quite, quite nicely, I think. Um, obviously, a healthy plant needs a healthy root system. A healthy plant runs at high energy levels which makes it more resistant to natural pests and diseases, right? But it all starts down here, at the bottom in the soil. And that is exactly where NPS then fits in. So the NPS does not stand for nitrogen, phosphorus, and sulfur. It stands for the land is precision sciences. Now what you'll notice is there will be a lot of overlapping with Eric's uh, presentation, especially on the soil wealth and the soil nutrition. But where we tend to drive and put a big effort in is in the soil biology. Because of this whole precision farming concept worldwide, that is something that was a bit neglected, all right? And at the end of the day, this is the business end. The soil biology is the business end of the soil. The bugs and the microorganisms, microbes, whether it be fungi or bacteria, plays a big and important role in mineralizing whatever we are trying to correct within the soil. They are making that happen in any way. So how do we get them going? That's a big drive, and although we won't focus in the presentation on that specific part, because the request was for preparation and precision farming, keep that in mind. So we have a big drive behind that. The, the big difference, the rule of thumb between, between uh, good soil biology and bad soil biology is the presence or absence of oxygen. And obviously, those are, those are the big influence there, the chemical, the chemical thing. All right. Um, <coughs> I'm going to hand over to Yanina. This is his field of expertise. As I said, we're going to do this in tandem. Thank you, Dion. Yes, um, like we were yesterday there in the orchards, I'm the guy that where everybody's looking at a tree, I'm digging in the soil. Um, that's my passion. And I think like Eric also mentioned, I mean, that's, that's something you have on your farm. And each farm differs. And I think we neglect to go back to basics and looking what type of soils you have. What am I dealt with? in a specific orchard. Um, I just show, we just show this, just to um, make clear, I think everybody know that if we talk about the chemical analysis and biology, that's usually the top soil part that we, did, did that we analy uh, um, analyze. And the physical part is actually how deep is the soil? What's the color of the soil? Um, is it well drained? Um, will avocados, for instance, suit there? 
Um, that, this, that is basically all that aspect. There's some farmers that still confuse it and think if you talk about soil classification, they refer to the, the, the top part, the chemical part. Okay, here's another did you know moment. Um, soil classification is not a new thing. It's like Zander said, you can go back to the old textbooks and you must revisit it. Um, there's a f the uh, earliest photo we can find of 1899 with a guy um, taking a soil analysis or physical um, analysis. Like uh, Eric already mentioned, there's different ways in doing soil classification. I'm talking about the physical aspects. You, um, in the grains, you especially you can use the dew probe. Um, then there's the hand augers that we use a lot. But for orchards, I would say what's, what's important for me is to have a profile pick. The reason for that is to not only to look at what type of soil, but I want to understand is the clay percentage going up or down? Um, what is water doing in that profile pit? But more importantly, where does my roots flush? Can I, you know, your roots will tell you something as well about that soil and is there enough oxygen, where's oxygen, and things like that. Um, then yes, we also have a platform. Um, I think it's important that all the information that we gathered, I mean, we're in the business of gathering information, so you need a platform like Eric also mentioned that you can layer it and you can see, all right, on this soil type, what's happening with my chemical analysis and things like that. And nowadays, I mean, we, I will later maybe go in detail with it. We've got Sirius. It's, a, it's, a, it's a on, on, on any Apple device, your tablet and things like that. And you can do scouting. You can do layering on that, on that platform. I think Eric explained um, the platform and how it works. It's basically similar. Then another thing, if you look at soil classification, there's some, and those three things, that, that are the first three aspects, it's, 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 if, if I can leave that with you today, is, is color, texture, and structure. Only those three things, you know, you can get very complicated if you're talking about soil names and things like that, and you say, oh, you know, and there's now a, you get the older the old guys will know there was a soil classification book and then I think it was uh, the purple one, then it came a blue one, there's a green one coming so that there's a couple of new soils coming in. But it's, uh, I think we don't, mustn't miss the point with the, the names of the soil, but we must understand what that name is, is. It tells you something about the soil, it tells you something about the color, it tells you something about the texture, the structure, and that's very important to understand drainage and do I need to reach, must I reach, how, how deep must I reach, um, and that is very important. And there you can see different types of soils. And each one, and you can get all the different types of soil in a block, and you must, you must respect the aspects of that soil. Um, if you're talking about blocks, how, do you must, how must I develop my blocks, lines, you know, if you go over different soils, then you must look at the, what's the majority soil type. Then I know my management, I'm, I'm managing the majority and not necessarily the the lower percentage of soil types you find in a block. Um, then things that we get out of soil classification is, is things like drainage. Do we need drainage? Is the soil well drained? Out of that, you will get uh, your fertilizer strategy. If you've got a soil that leaches a lot, I mean, you must uh, adopt with your fertilizer strategy what you're going to do. You can't manage all the blocks the same, and it starts with soil classification. Your irrigation strategy, like I said, I talked to, we talked yesterday about it as well. I think there's the, the um, what Michael talked about. I mean, there's a, not a lot of new development that's coming in to assist the farmer um, and making the blocks, you know, different if you talk about irrigation scheduling and things like that. Another thing I will show it later as well, what Eric also mentioned, is where do you put your probe? I mean, is it on the right soil top? Is it in the soil top that that represent your block. You know, there's little things like that that makes a huge difference, especially with scheduling. All right, just to show you what do you get back, what you can expect if you do the soil classification, you get a, typically there's a block of 10.9 hectares. You get a farm map to just to show you. And then also like, like what Eric will do, you, you, you give a topography. I think it's very important. It shows you which direction water flows. Um, for your scheduling, and then it's like layers. And then the next 
is also your soil. What type of soils you have? In this, as, uh, like you can see here, it's only 10 hectares, but you get three, four, five, six different soil types in that 10 hectares. If we look at the soil types in that block, we will focus on the, like you can see, 43% 40, is ograbis. I don't know if you know what the ograbi soil type is, but that's a soil that's got very high calcium in the B horizon, free calcium. And it's very important if you start reading and things to know that because you don't really want to bring that calcium, and you will see it on the chemical maps. You don't want to bring that calcium to the top because you're going to have lots of iron deficiencies and things like that. So yeah, there you can see just the picture of the different swells in that block. There's the ograbis, there's the oak leaf, and there's a the fernwood. The fernwood, you can, you can see in the, in the photos, this is a very sandy swell, more clay swell, loamy swell, and there, you know, that's sort of in between but you need to manage those soils differently. And that comes back to your planning of your blocks, how you're gonna plan your blocks in your irrigation. Another one that Eric also mentioned, it's very important, is the plant available water. Um, this soil type, because it's so very sandy, if you look at the soil moisture retention, there is the one for the sandy soils, there is the one for the clay soils, this can, and we, we usually um, show it in millimeter. 160 to 100, uh, 140 to 160 millimeter in the oak leaf. That's a more loamy soil, so it can retain more water. Your sandy soil less. So the importance of that is, for instance, if you have like we had now, um, uh, a lot of rain, a, a, a very good rain spell, we can expect leaching, for instance, on that soil. And another thing is, I mean, in when you have to, you have a lot. You need a lot of water for fruit, fruit size, and and in times of fruit drop, then you can expect that there will be more stress there because there's a lot of need for water. And, and then you can, what you see in the field can be explained with your soil, soil map. Here's another one that we do is, this we do especially for new orchards. Um, there's a lot of mistakes the guys do when they plant the new orchards or they start to develop the new orchards. It's important to, to find out, but is the soil suited for the crop you're gonna plant and how I'm gonna do the preparation. Now the first thing we also look at is, is your, so it's, sorry it's in Afrikaans, but um, how, how is the soil suited for irrigation? Is it, can, can I irrigate the soil? You know, is, is, is it well drained, things like that? And you can see that the darker greens is the soil that's very suited for irrigation. And then when you go down to the lighter colors is less suited for irrigation. And then we also do, like, we give a recommendation on how must I um, manage or the irrigation. And these areas, we would say that you will have to look at the uh, a probe in those areas to see what the probe tells you. And in certain areas, you have to go, in, like, more in a pulse irrigation. Those sandy areas, we can expect that we rather need to go to a, a pulse irrigation or little, little water, but more frequently, for instance. If we look at the soil classification, then we can do the, the planning of the blocks better. So in this case, is because we look at the soil classification, we, we recommended three different blocks because it needs to be irrigated differently. Your, your fertilizer strategy must be different on those. And also, like, I, like Eric mentioned, is these areas is GPS points where you want to put your probe. That is for that block, it's the, it's the representative soil for that block. Um, and the way we decide where to put a probe is we keep in mind your slope, keep in mind the soil, and the plant available water of the, of the soils. So very importantly, and I think that's why Pete also asked Zander the question yesterday, do you keep in mind your clay content of your soil before you do ridging? I think it's very important because of experience, we've noted that it's not always kept in mind and what happens is if you get a soil that the B horizon is very clay and we reach very high, we tend to put that clay on top of the ridge. And then you've got problems like your water infiltration is not what it's supposed to be. Um, you can get sodium buildup, um, oxygen, you know, your oxygen uh, between the soil and the air is not very good. 
So it's important that we respect the characteristics of the soil before we do preparation. Obviously, there's a practical aspect as well, but we must sort of find a, the middle path, if I can put it like that. So typically, uh, what, we, what we give is um, we give you the depth of the soil you can use to put on the, on the um, ridge. So if we say 30 centimeters, we, what we mean about that is you can take for the top soil 30 centimeters to use for your ridge. If you go below that, you must know you're going to a more clay soil or a big calcium ridge soil, and you're going to induce some problems for you on the, on the ridge. And then also what we do is we, we give a map. Here you can see the green e areas we suggested you can reach, and there's the depth of the, of the, well, from, of the soil you can use for the ridge. The green is, for instance, you can reach there, but make sure you mix that soil well. I know it, it, it could be a practical issue, but make sure you mix that soil well before you make a reach. And then there's areas you can just reach. It's fine. The clay percentage is uh, such that you can easily reach. There's no quite a difference in clay percentage if you go down. Just another one for, for block layout. This was also done the, where the, guy, uh, the farmer got us in. It's a new farm. Just to check where can how can he where can he put his blocks, his different irrigation and things like that. So there you can see it was about 57, uh, 75 hectares. Lots of soil differences in this area specifically. It was in the Eastern Cape. They've got a, and each area has got its own challenges, but they've got a lot of calcium-rich soils. And it's very important that you give recommendations how to reach there, for instance. Um, but yeah, just to give you an idea, there is, look at the difference of plant available water, where that soil can give back to the, to the plants, you must keep that in mind. So the soil and the plant available water in a 3D map, there's how your scheduling must be. Some of the soils needs to be more of a pulse scheduling, less water, more frequently, and the others you can, you can just look at what the probe tells you. And out of that information, then you can plan your blocks and your manageable areas according to the, the need for the scheduling and also the respect as well. Um, just about probes, if you read there, it is queer luck, you have to have a it is cocker luck. And, and uh, th that's very important, just to stress, where do you put your probes? You have to respect the swells and, and do it according to that. Here's just a nice example just to show. Um, here's a, it's, it's, it, I mean, it's on grain. It's a, it's a pivot, but I think the same concept uh, counts. You can see it's a, it's a combined data. So the green says here was very good yields and there's less yields. So lots of times you get this information, but, you know, like Eric also said, you need to make sense of what you're seeing. If you're talking about NDVI images, um, there's a lot of imagery and things like that, but you must understand what am I seeing. And to do that, as a soil scientist, it always reverts back to your swells. And here you can see this, if, if we talk about color, you, like you guys know, red color means well-drained, yellow or gray color means, you know, there's an oxygen problem, not well-drained. So if you look at these two photos, nice red swells that you guys have here. And this is a bit of a wet swell. If you look at the color alone, it can tell you that. So what would you think will be the problem here? And it's definitely irrigation or a scheduling problem. You know, he gives enough water here, but to give enough water here, he's over irrigating there. You know, and that's the type of things you must look at and start. And it's not always practical, but must, but, but must look in this direction to get, you know, small things get very good results. Then um, I think Dion will, be, will go on with the chemical side of things. Yeah, um, I'm not going to stretch um, too long over this. I um, just want to get back to the mobile application for our platform, platform over here. Um, I think it is quite obvious here that as soon as you gather a lot of data that needs to be centralized, I think Eric, Eric stretched that as well. And um, you need to be able to work with the data. So we are privileged to um, have a, a GIS team within our midst um, 
which is quite clued up um, and has been in the game for about, I don't know, 15, 17 years. And what, so this is a, this platform is called Cirrus. It's available on the App Store. Um, basically, you also get a password and a login code. You can access your data and whomever else serves you that you want to allow to see your data. All right, so I'm not going to go into how this platform works exactly now. But for instance, your chemical rep or your agronomist or your irrigation service provider, you can allow certain functions to him. All right, so you can see um, your irrigation or you can see your fertilizer or your fertigation, whatever is happening. Um, and we prefer cloud-based because then you make yourself independent from server problems. All right, so that is <coughs> that's the reasoning behind that. So we already spoke quite a bit about soil grading and stuff. Let's just put it in pers perspective, just quickly say why. If you take, and this is purely for mathematic purposes, 100 hectares, and we say that most of our plant nutrient feeder roots is in the top 30 or 25, 20 centimeters. So we want to represent that area within a soil sample. And we take soil or bulk density of soil as one, just for calculation, which is sort of a clay soil, high CC soil. Then you quickly come, come down to the fact that you want to represent with a single sample, traditional sort of sampling, um, 300,000 300, tons of soil with a soil sample weighing less than a half a kilogram. So what gridding does is it gives you a better spatial representation of what's going on. All right, so obviously traditional sort of approaches is not, is not uh, realistic anymore. Um, then we do it on a grid, which is georeferenced, as you know by, by now know. And very important to notice is that our biggest cost from our side will be lab analysis. All right, that's our biggest cost. And because we do a hell of a lot of hectares, we do get to bargain a bit. But still, to, um, the, and, uh, and I must, must say this, that in, in the industry, the easiest thing would be to take soil samples, all right, put it together, and that's, that's what is happening in the industry. So see, this is a sort of a warning. Mix those samples up, analyze one, and put the data back to the GPS point and create a map. So um, very important to make sure that you get every, every analysis for every single point back when you do this. That's just another did you know fact that already in 1845 or so, we there around about, they started looking at soil mapping. And I'm pretty sure everybody is comfortable now that pH is not a new science, so we're not going to go into it, but just to stretch how important gridding is. And then how the same soil map that Yanni showed you, how soil physical properties actually drives soil nutrient chemical properties. So there you have calcium, which is high, blue is high, green is norm, uh, or, or good. And then calcium percentage also high, and look at it. Wherever you had your free calcium carbonate, that correlates perfectly, indicating that soil chemical uh, properties is driven by soil physical properties. So this is a video, a silent one, so I'll talk you through it if you can get play. Should we hit play? Control room. Play. All right, so what I want you to notice, notice the soil surface area, look at the color and the condition of the citrus trees, right? And as soon as you get here, notice the difference in the trees as well as in the topsoil. And what we saw in the soil map, that's exactly that. It was a free calcium carbonate layer, and they reached it up onto the top. Is it? And then you get suppression of iron uptake, zinc uptake, most of the metals, which is essential nutrients. Um, you see dieback of trees. So that is a understanding soil wrong going into a standard practice of something as essential or critical as hedging. All right, so that is how, how uh, decision on these things drive it. And then uh, we all know, like we now said, that the suppression, so uh, our soil physical properties will drive that whole process. Again, um, Variable rate application, there's a lot of work that needs to be done with this, all right? Um, especially in established or orchards. I mean, obviously, if you, if you are going to develop a field, it's fairly easy to spread out or spray out and then do your soil preparation. But how do we go about in, uh, in, 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 in existing orchards? And I think that's a challenge for, for everybody in the industry at the moment. But just, uh, just to show quickly, High levels of potassium in this instance, and Eric el elaborated on how important potassium is. So whenever it's low, you need to, to vary that and therefore spread your input cost, right? 
and we did speak about Vidibat. And so we are looking very strongly into variable rate application through spreading uh, orchard spreaders. Um, we realize that as we go forward, this will become more and more important, developing this whole program, um, and thereby also obtaining a Topcon GPS hardware um, agency to help us along with development of this. So we can maybe speak a bit afterwards where we are. We have seen some some good results with spreading uh, onto the onto the uh, rows. Obviously, there is limitations to it. All right, let's just quickly make the calculation. We've been talking around a lot about input costs, and I'm going to fly over this really quickly. There's your magnesium percentage. Obviously, we're running into deficiencies. That will be a, a, a variable application map, uh, ranging between anything between 50 and 350 kilograms, and this is what the math will look like. If you had to go and apply the standard recommendation that was there for, for this orchard for a flat rate of 300 kilograms of magnesium sulfate, that was a flat rate recommendation, your cost would have been around 15 grand. And if you went variable, you had a saving of, um, you had a saving of 356 rand per hectare. That's for the product only, right? Same applied for, for the potassium sulfate with another saving of 700 and 700 rand a hectare. Is everybody comfortable with the calculation? Do you want me to, to go slower? So that's a total saving of around, in product only, of just over a grand per hectare. And in this instance, that paid for the whole soil mapping, physical properties, and gridding. More than. All right. So you even had some money left to do the VRT, VRT application. That was a pivot that was developed into a citrus orchard about a year ago. All right, we spoke about this, understanding how gradient works. Everybody spoke about that this morning. That's accumulation of salts, exactly where water comes together. And that also indicates why we have a phosphorus buildup, all right? And zinc depression, everything else we heard this morning. Um, why? Because we don't have a root system. The root system is burned down by the salt. Same as what you would do, do with a game skin or animal skin, applying salt onto it. And then something I just wanted to stretch out this morning, because th this is something we see in most established orchards that have been going for some time and most irrigation schemes over the country and even international, is silt layering. Silt is obviously a very fine, pa uh, you know, much more fine part particle size than sand. So it tends to settle down in layers. And whenever water infiltrates soil and it goes from one texture class to another, it tends to sit until it's saturated and then moves forward again, which leaves you with with sort of uh, uh, waterlock conditions, even if it's temporary, right? And when you have waterlock conditions, there's absence of oxygen. When you have uh, uh, absence of oxygen, you have basically death, right? So that's why it's important for us to take out fine detail, and I think this is the message, fine detail. The finer you can go, the better. The intensity, the thickness of those salt layers. And this is typical, this is sort of a telltale that we've picked up whenever we have the salt layering. Algae growing on the soil surface. That's a telltale indication of, of aeration issues, very often linked to silt layering. So we've spoken a lot, and I know the whole industry and the whole standard for, um, and obviously when you have silt layering and w sort of waterlock conditions, then higher magnesium and higher sodium is, is, is the consequence. And we've been speaking a lot, and the industry standard has always been gypsum and lime and gypsum and lime and when to use what. And unfortunately, unfortunately, with uh, some uh, in, in inconsistent results, right? So just to go over it again, calcium has a flocculating effect on your soil when it's in a right, right relation. Magnesium tends to close soil up, form that capping that has become another hotspot word. There's some just a nice picture to show where gypsum was applied and the flocculation. The difference in soil structure, where you get flocculated, it looks, you have root development going like this because it's nice and aerated with pockets of root development and areas of no root development where you have zero soil structure or magnesium and sodium buildup. All right, so Zander, I know you don't want us to go into products, but I sort of, this was developed in with, with that same approach. We don't want to go into product, but we want to, why do we get limited results using gypsum and lime? There's, there's, there's quite a few reasons. Two of them being, for them to work, they need to dissolve, which they are poor in, right? Gypsum and lime. And then they need to move. So, which is limited when you have capping, right? So, we have gone and developed something we call decompact, right? It's a water-soluble calcium base that we, uh, 
that we uh, partnered with a uh, high-grade fulvic acid, right? Um, and we've also added a non-ionic wetting agent. And the whole reasoning will be to get this uh, already so, uh, you know, dissolved calcium into the soil, displacing magnesium and sodium, which we would like to have been doing with gypsum and, and lime. As soon as those get knocked off, bind them with the fulvic acid, which has a negative charge as soil dust, just much higher. And then allow the wetting agent, because it's non-ionic, it doesn't carry a charge, get it out of the profile. All right. And we've, see, we've been seeing, and this for us, is where we are also focusing on precision farming. It's coming with real-time solutions. All right. Now you have a liquid, so you can go through irrigation. And I'm going to show you another uh, video now. It's in Afrikaans. Sorry for the international people. Um, this was myself and Yanni, coincidentally. Um, so you can play this, and then after the Afrikaans is finished, I'll just is say again what happened. By Benny Vermaak, and uh, and Patency, we'll see you in a citru citrus board, Portugalia as the boerderij. Um, he laid ernstige, ernstige compactie in the boerground, water wat nie wil penetreer nie of wil penetreer nie. Dis min of meer hoe dit die onder die drippers gelyk het vir die hele boord. Julle kan daar sien die benattingsarea, tipies mosgroei, water wat staan. Julle kan ook daar sien, daar is bykie uh, Tiger 90 toegedien. Maar die groot geheim hier is, daar is uh, 100 liter uh, die compact toegedien. Nou hier is een gat, gaan vir Janie vraag volgens my die penetrometer daar te druk. Julle kan duidelijk sien die water staan. Nog in die vol effect nie, hy gaan nie in nie nie eers 5 cm nie in die water staan in hy gat, so ons het typisch tydelike anaerobiese toestande daar, en ons kan het in die bome ook sien, ons kan die bome ook sien, en die bome stand het, die drag is maar eil, vergroot, en wil nie vir hierdie tyd van die jaar recht wees nie. Nou as ons net oorstap na die ander rij toe, waar die 100 liter decompact toegedien is, volle werking reeds, uh, daar is die benattings area, kan julle sien die dripper, Julle kan sien hy was ook maar gecompacteer, daar is ook mosgroei, so die selle symptome, maar dit is na die compact hierdie ene. So, <laughs> ek dink, uh, ek, ek dink daai, uh, the proof is in the pudding. Ja, dit is nie een professionele video nie, maar ek dink die boodskap is duidelik, and, and for the international people, so what happened there, you had water sitting under the dripper, right, Cause because of the silt laying over time, a high magnesium, high sodium, so that whole capping debate, and um, that that decompact basically just went and opened up space and immediately oxygen oxygenated the whole system as well, allowing aeration to take place. All right, so that that's about decompact. I'm not going to talk about this one now. Um, Okay, the question is, is it, is it applied over the whole area, or is it applied through the irrigation through the drip and micro? And the, uh, the short answer will be both. Um, it depends on the, on, the, on the situation and the occasion. Obviously, in broad acre, where we have similar conditions, maybe pivots, then we apply through pivot or, or spray, right? And in this instance, it was applied through, through the drip irrigation. Excellent, Sean. I think the message here is, and I think you touched on that as well now. Um, what Sean said now to the people maybe that you didn't, didn't hear, he applied, amongst others, decompact in, in the whole range of Nolanda solution based on our soil sort of um, uptake. And he had some incredible results. He, can see he, he testifies that it's day and night. 
And um, I think that the, the whole principle here is that it is specific application. So decompact is not a fix all tool. It's a it's a sort of a application specific for salts, bu salt buildup, drainage. What you know, and that's the message. And it's based on soil data. So thanks, Sean. Um, all right. So just quickly to run by, um, we tend to use the new test for leaf analysis. So new test is a wet wet um, wet tissue analysis as opposed to a normal dry leaf or dry dry matter analysis. It gives you a nice indication fairly with with a sort of a um, bird's eye view of what's happening with high and low and optimum. It gives you excellent norms and figures of in, in terms of relation to analysis, the nutrients to each other. And I think for us, the, the big advantage is um, with the new test, you get exceptional quickly turnaround time. So from the time the sample reaches the lab till you get the results is 48 hours, rule of thumb, right? Which is quick. Which enables you to, to sort of uh, react within the same growth stage, which brings us to the next advantage. There is growth stage specific norms for most crops, um, including arrows. All right, so you can see there's the different growth stages with norms, where the norms will be then applied to that specific growth stage. Okay, so it's not a one fit all sort of norm, it's growth stage specific. So that's why, why we're tending towards the, the new test for our leaf analysis. And then Eric mentioned NDVI, and yes, like most things in life, there is pros and cons, limitations, and etc. For us, NDVI is an easy and very cheap way to get a, v a, a good overview of what's happening when. Um, here's just a few slides we put together for, for an orchard. You can see the date there is on May the 5th last year. And this is just a progression. I skipped a few images um, just to, to show you a progression, right? So there is it not going. Okay, let me explain NDVI. All right, sorry. I did not, sorry, Peter, thanks for the question. NDVI, what's NDVI? In layman's terms, it would be um, different wavelengths of infrared and near-infrared light coming in and reflecting or being absorbed from leaf surface or green surface. And the wavelength back, the difference between in and out, is indexed, right? So it gives you an indication of plant stress or plant virility, basically, right? So like Eric rightly said, if you identify zones which indi index indicates stress, unfortunately from, in from NDVI, you, you can't uh, conclude what the reason for that plant stress is, whether it's water or whatever. But what it does enable you is from wherever you are in the world to say, let's have a look what's happening there. Because there must be a reason for that plant stressing. And uh, in, in my opinion, that's a great thing. Because it empowers you to know go exactly where, and it forces you to go to orchards, or somebody to go to the orchards, whether it be a representative from your chemical company, your agent, your agronomist, your farm manager, whomever. Your All right, so there we go. So that's the 29th of May, and you can already see the difference. I'm just going to go back and forth quickly. You can see there's an area develop developing here for some other reason. Now that stress is a little bit relieved. Two weeks later, oh no, this is in August, so I just skipped a few. There's an area development here, but this this part here is, is continuously doing good. All right, as we're going into August, and then obviously you can correlate this to growth stage and time of year. And as you get into the summer months, where your water usage is becoming higher and higher, that's 16th of December last year. Oh, sorry. Um, you can obviously see. So in this case, uh, it was a sort of a, Glen Rosa soil type, rocky, stony, well drained, not able to store a lot of water, and that was the reason behind that stress. So what do we go and do? It's a whole different debate. Um, I think I'm going to conclude with that. So I don't know if there's any questions. question is, is it on? Yeah. The question is, where do we obtain the images from? Um, no problem. We've partnered with a big 
uh, company, um, so it's from Satellite, we've partnered with them, buy in bulk, and, uh, and then, yeah, that's the answer. So it's uh, sa Satellite based, we sort of um, put them out every two weeks, so yeah. Just to answer that as well, Peter, um, we also looked at drones. I mean, uh, at, at this stage, drones was quite a buzzword, as everybody know, um, especially for LDVI and things like that. Um, there's a lot of issues of drones that also come with that. I mean, license and all those type of things. Um, previously, in the early a couple of years ago, you know, ima uh, satellite imagery took too long, you know, and, and you couldn't get day to day, but it changed a lot because of all of the satellites that's in the air, you can get every day, you can get images. Um, and why do you want to go then the, with the, the drone route? Yeah, I don't know if it answers your question. Um, and certain aspects, I mean, if, if you know it's an area that's very cloudy, I mean, a drone will make more sense maybe. But yeah, just uh, so we, we partnered with guys that gives us NVI images from satellites. Thank you. Yeah, that, that's very important. I mean, it, it depends on your um, pixel size and how, how, how small is it, you know. Obviously, there's, um, if you look at orchards, you, the smaller, the better. I mean, you get more detail and things like that. But, um, um, yeah, uh, we go as, I'm not sure, Dion, if you can help me, what's the smallest um, detail we go on the satellite images? Yeah. Five tuck, five. Yeah, and, and, and the thing is, I mean, um, what we've noticed also when we looked into drones, I mean, okay, obviously, like you said, the resolution, I mean, you, the smaller, the better, and you get more detail. But also what, what bothered me with the initially with the, with the drones is the turnaround time, you know. We also had a guy that flew, you know, it looks impressive, you, you a very nice drone, an EB drone that they used. And but, you know, if, uh, the stitching of those things takes time. There's a lot of information in it. You know, I was a bit disappointed in the turnaround time where the satellite imagery for me more in time, you know, it's, it's a less of an issue. That's why we went more that way. Um, Peter, like I said, I don't know the finer details, but the stitching, you know, because it's a photo and a photo and then they overlay it. That seems to be the main issue. You know, there's a lot of data, maybe Eric, do you also, but the, the stitching part of it takes quite a long time. I don't know if it maybe just was that provider that was was taking long. I mean, obviously, they will improve that over time, but that was the issue for us. I mean, we need to be in time with those things. You see, and that's th that's not, I mean, then things changed already after three weeks, you know. There's currently a program out EST that is the doing the stitching while he's flying. So you get an NDVI image as the drone is flying, you get it, the, the stitching is done um, on on computer, so it's it's going quite quick. When, when with the new programs, when it was older, definitely like Yanni saying, sometimes it took five weeks to just get an image. But currently, the new equipment and the software is stitching it while it's flying. Um, thanks, Sander. Yeah, I've just um, the majority of both of the talks have been around. The dis ma uh, a lot of what we can do in the preparation to plant an orchard. Um, and soil samples are, are really the starting point and, and, and it's really, really good. It is also a one-off and it's responsible farm development. Um, the real success of grain farmers and precision farming has been that it has become 
a, a suitable management tool for ongoing. In fact, it's, it ends up being the, the, the center or the heartbeat of these guys that take it seriously. You know, issues like yield ex uh, uh, forecasting, single tree management, tree health, um, the actual recording of yields, um, we, we, we talk almost on a tree by tree basis. Okay, mm -hmm. we're getting away from that in some ways with high density planting. But that's kind of our mindset, being involved in both fields in the past. I've not seen the jump being successfully made into orchards. And I'm waiting for it because I know it's not impossible, but the tools we're seeing now, the it's, it's a wonderful, very high level tool that once a year when you talk uh, fertilizer and you, you talk some of the yield issues, but on a day-to-day -day basis like the grain guys are using, do you see and when and how does something that is packaged for the intensive farmers like 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 um, fruit farmers? Um, uh, w when do you see that coming out? You know, something where even a further dumb down for junior and medium level management starts being able to engage, because I see this as still very, very uh, technically driven and not uh, managerially. I'm, I'm not. It's not a criticism. Just an overall observation over time. And we haven't gone in depth into these things, but managerially, I think that's where the real advances are going to come. Um, I don't know if I'm being clear, but I just mm. see it's sometimes a little too out of reach. You know, variable eight appli uh, rate applications is, is the success factor of precision farming and grain. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think if I can just add there, I think uh, one of the misperceptions is that technology is expensive. I think you mentioned this morning that it's becoming cheaper and cheaper. And I think, you know, PJ will also touch on it in his um, presentation about the cheap things that can be done. Um, Edrian and, and PJ also started with it. I don't know whether they discussed it this morning, um, or well, they, whether they will discuss it this morning. But with simple systems like RFID tagging, you can manage a lot of things on a tree-to-tree -tree basis. We we started last year with a bulk bin harvesting program, um, and the way that it's working now is every laborer has a RFID tag. Uh, they tag in, they tag out, um, they tag every time they harvest. And um, the bin for the packhouse also has an RFID tag on it. So when we harvest, the next step is they harvest and they tag the bin. Um, and the next step would be when that bin reaches the packhouse, hopefully the packhouse will also employ an RFID tag. So by that time, at least we know in which, which section of the orchard, because that's also GPS located through the phone or through the tablet. And by that time, you should be able to know in which sections of the orchard do you get what from. And but PJ, I, I think will elaborate on that. Um, and uh, I, I think there's uh, there's a few things around it, um, but again, it's not that expensive to get there. I think the point of this workshop was specifically that, uh, you know, I'm also almost at the point where you get irritated um, by the fact that you know precision farming almost stops at you know let's call it grain farming or maize or whatever. And I think. You know, we at that point now where we as fruit farms, but specifically ourselves sitting here as avocado farmers, need to demand these products. You know, we even if you look at tractors, even if you look at look at spraying machines like I mentioned this morning, we're way behind. And you know, it's uh, uh, the equipment that you see in the Cape, just for example, the harvesting equipment, um, basic things, ladders, harvesting ladders, whatever. It's things that aren't sold here because we aren't demanding it, you know, it's the demand's not there. We aren't also telling people that we want that. Yes, quickly, just to answer w one of, of the, the question, just quickly, I, I think uh, we've got farmers that now for 12 years been on the system, some of them, yeah, I think the oldest farmers about 14 years and it's orchards. Currently there's about uh, between 23 and 25,000 hectares that's being managed on precision farming. Variable spreading in the orchards is working really good. I mean, there's um, guys in Nelspray that is already doing it on a contracting basis. And the bigger the farm the farm is, the more of the guys already change their variable spreaders around. The next thing is irrigation shedding. Your probes, it's a continuous type of thing. Where to put my probe? What is my lines? Field water capacity, wilting point, refill point. So that is a continuous type of thing. Yield is definitely something that's, that's getting there. Like I said, like you said, the bulk bins is, is one thing. 
um, the bulk bins on the on the load cells is another thing that's happening currently. And then it's the picking per per picker that it can show us where in the tree is even picking. So we quite sure that we're going to roll out that commercially um, next year. Um, we're quite advanced in how we can get yields on different layers of the tree. So it's per tree and it's different layers. You can see what's what what is the amount on the top and what is on the bottom. And then if you put it through to your pack house and you take your culling factor and you brought that, that back to your to your field as well. So now suddenly it's almost more continuously than your than your grain farmer. And um, part of that web page that we had is a is something that we develop as an activity planner. So if you've got an activity that you need to spray certain pesticides or you need to give certain fertilizers, you just fill it in on that activity plan and you start to have all that data for that specific one block. And that is when you're getting a real advantage out of the data. Um, I think if I can just make a last comment. Um, and uh, David, I think it ties into what you're saying. The important thing is we don't have platforms where we start demand demanding these things. People won't know what we want if we don't demand it. And, and that's why it didn't bother me to get two precision farming systems, you know, next to each other because they won't know what we want. And the thing is, you know, um, we had another um, farm management program on our system, which we bought over and we moved away from it because it was developed in the Cape for the industries there. And a lot of the info that you had to capture in that program before you could actually start managing your system wasn't applicable to avocado farming. So we threw out the system. It's a good system, but it's not applicable to the avocado industry. It's a fruit industry, but it's not even applicable to us. So even when we get to the point of, you know, harvesting, you know, something suits some farmers. Some people just, you know, want to plug something in and see the report. Other people want to see the report and an analysis of the report and then t that tied into fertilizer programs. So, you know, uh, these custom fit programs are very important and I think that's that's what we try and work towards and you know custom demand. I think there's another question at the back. I can hear with your psalms to me. Just for the international guests, it's it's really really crucial that whatever we do in precision farming, it needs to be adapted at least for each different fruit crop that we have, and even more, I agree, different. And that's one of the limitations, in my opinion, when we get to satellite photos and standard norms, 
is that varieties differ. Just if you're going to look at a Pinkerton, a Lamas, and a Maluma orchard, they're all semi-dwarfing um, varieties. But if you look at photos of them, you know, aerial shots, you're going to see differences. Um, it will reflect differently. And the point is not now we dis precision farming because no, it doesn't suit us. The point that I want to make is be aware of that. Uh, communicate these things. And, and, and the thing is, you know, even uh, you spoke about, you know, satellite photos or drone photos um, isn't ideal when the trees in flush. We spoke during the orchard visit yesterday um, wh when I started applying multi coat and, and the controlled release fertilizers. It's as if my trees are constantly flushing. They're not running away from me, but I'm happy with the amount of tree growth that I'm. And now I need to adapt to that. You know, now there's not, you know, when do I take my photos? When don't I take photos? And that's not the same for the next avocado farmer. So even within the avocado industry, because people use different fertilizers and whatever, and that's why, you know, the, the, the boots on the ground principle almost. And, you know, to me, collaboration is the important word there. I, I, you know, if we don't speak as an industry and different industry about our demands, it's, it won't help. Um, just the last comment about that, because I, I just want to push time a bit, um, is also in terms of norms, um, norms, in our opinion, is a very relative um, word. At the end of the day, you also need to look at um, what is my expected um, nutrient removal of the crop that I'm estimating. So when we have fruit set now, we're already applying the fertilizer for the current crop to support the current crop, but also to estimate the next crop after that and to you know start preparing ourselves for that. So uh, uh, you know it's a philosophy that my dad follows very strictly um, in our fertilizer programs, and one of the reasons why we don't take you know a general fit um, fertilizer program because we want it custom fit for every orchard. You know, my first um, harvest estimate is done, you know, almost at flowering, right after, um, well, around the time that we receive back our soil and, and leaf analysis. Because then already we need to start planning. And a lot of the times, yes, you know, fruit set drops, you know, temperatures changes, but at least I'm trying to estimate where do I expect my crop and, and what fertilizer should I put down. Otherwise, you're just reactive and not, not proactive. Um, so yeah, I think then I would just, um, I know, you know, David mentioned now about, yeah, we're focusing a lot on, on development, um, but you know, process is very important, but I do want to ask Paul just quickly to chat about, um, the way that he sees, you know, practical orchard layout, practical irrigation layout for the main reason that we are all expanding. Um, the industry is, is expanding at a rate that and if you aren't aware of specific things that you need to be careful about, like slopes and the effect of slopes on your irrigation, um, then I think, you know, you're missing the point and you're just causing a cost, you know, down the line again, because you'll have to either adapt the system or this or that. And I think, you know, um, there's so many uh, things that change constantly. And I think, you know, also, um, the differences between micros and drip and these things all have an, eff an effect on uh, and the selection thereof on the effect of the system at the end of the day and the efficiency of the system. So um, I think while Paul walks up, um, uh, I think you know we we're very privileged to have someone like Paul among us. Um, you know his experience, his knowledge um, is amazing, and you know um, I think. You know, I spoke yesterday about strategic partnerships, about, you know, like-minded people, and that I believe, you know, those things should be natural. You know, it should be an easy process. I shouldn't be forced into a relationship with someone. It should be a natural thing. And I think the, the fortunate thing with Paul is, again, it's a natural thing because he tries uh, and do pro uh, practical problem solving. And that's something that, that I think very few people um, with orchard design really understand. So I have to compliment Paul on that. Thanks, Paul. And then as well, I think um, Paul's very shy. He basically just wanted his logo on, on the program and then said that's enough. But I think, uh, Paul, I need to thank you for, for the main sponsorship as well. Um, again, it, it makes it possible for farmers to attend free of charge. So thanks for that.
uh, thanks Zander and thanks for the opportunity. I haven't prepared anything, I was put on the spot. Um, but as I walked up and you, s you talk about precision and practical, I don't think a precision layout will be a practical layout. <laughs> um, in the past, all the blocks need to be square, same lengths, same tree amount, same sizes to make it easy for the farmer. If we go and look on Google Earth, especially in our areas, you will see straight tree lines, wind breaks, etc., etc. And I think the future will change on that. If we look to the, the precision layout, you'll have small blocks of irrigations with your soil types, with your drainage of the soil. The whole, the whole concept will change. Zander, and you've mentioned it, I don't think if you start a, a new development that you should only sit with your irrigation guy. All the other guys that's involved in your farm should be there. Um, there's so, so much knowledge available and so many experts out there that, that for, for uh, irrigation specialists to know everything, I think it's just too much. Um, we quite believe in, in using the experts out there that, that specializes in certain fields and, um, and, and get them all involved in, in, in the orchard layout. On the end of the day, the decision is still with the farmer. Does he want to go with the precision route? I think if you, if you decide to go that route, you must go the full way with it. You mustn't, it's, it's all nice to have, but if you don't implement it right, it's a waste of time and money. Um, just remember that the irrigation scheme, the capital cost is 5% of the running cost of that irrigation scheme. And all your farmers here, look at the bottom line. Don't always look at the bottom line of the cost. Look for the next 20 years what the operational cost of that irrigation scheme will be. I think that's, that's one of the most important things. Energy cost is going to go up. Um, all the other costs are going to go up. You've got one chance the day when you do your land prep, when you do your layouts for the next 20 years, it's going to be fixed like that. If you want to change it, it's going to be a lot of money. So I would say do the planning right. You only got that opportunity once in your life. So uh, thanks again for the opportunities, uh, Zander. We're coming a long way with Alice Beste, with Andre. Andre is not an easy client, <laughs> as you know. <laughs> He's... <laughs> <laughs> Uh, many, many hours we've sat and, and we've argued things out, but I think then the result is, is there. Um, but he doesn't accept anything. He, he always argues, why is it like that? He's always questioning it, and it keeps you on your toes. Don't, don't expect anything that the, your irrigation guy tells you is, is right or is the truth. And there's a big difference between a cheap irrigation system and a well-designed irrigation system. Thanks. Um, I think just two things that, um, sorry, that influenced our orchard designs a bit. And I think I just would like Paul perhaps to comment on it or just touch on it. Is, um, you know, when, when I got on the farm, the first orchard that we planted was a nice looking 13 hectare block right down, uh, not a big slope, but beautiful 13 hectares of avocados. If you stand at the top, it makes a nice photo. Um, and you know, s a movement, in my opinion, is more towards now that you want smaller and smaller blocks. I think one of the limitations with precision farming coming in is a lot of it is on established orchards, established farms. And the problem with that is now you start harvesting and you start irrigating, but you have your probes in and, you know, you want to apply fertilizers and things to specific blocks and, you know, leaf analysis, soil analysis. And it's almost the same as what is the ideal grid size, but what is the ideal irrigation size? Um, because if you walk onto a, you know, a, a, a Gwinnett, Gwinnett farm, a, a wine farm, um, you know, a lot of the orchards aren't even a hectare big. Um, so it's a natural process that they're going to micromanage. If you walk onto 300 hectares, it's quite a different scenario. Um, but I think, you know, in general, um, you know, irrigation blocks aren't really designed more than a hectare, you know, per irrigation valve. But um, 
with soil variants and these things, will we in time perhaps move to smaller and smaller blocks? Um, and, you know, yes, there's a cost implication to it, but ignoring cost, what would be the ideal in your opinion? Uh, firstly, it will depend on the irrigation <laughs> scheme, if it's drip or micro. On, on drip blocks, we tend to go on to uh, bigger irrigation blocks because your flows is lower and you want to irrigate a bigger area at once. But if we look at precision farming again, now you'll have a bigger block but with different soil types maybe. And you don't want that because you want the micromanagement. So you'll have to go to the smaller blocks. So th then it's immediately a cost implication. It's extra valve, extra pipelines, things like that. Um, but, but I think if, if, you if, you if you ideally look on an on a irrigation block size for, for micro between one, one and a half hectares, on a normal 8 by 4 spacing, that's, a, that's an average size of block. Uh, drip blocks will be in the area between 4 and 6 hectares. Um, that, that will be the size. The, the big challenge, <laughs> if we go into the mountains like Hansfontein, is pressures, as you mentioned previously. Uh, it's much easier to generate pressures to get rid of it, because you can just go with a pipe size so small, and with that, then you get velocity <laughs> problems. And and other problem problems with that, so <laughs> it is a challenge if you go into 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 the mountainous areas. Uh, but then again, do you plant on contours? Yes or no? Uh, do you go straight with the with the slope? Um, you know, when when I did your first design for your dad, he said to me, N "No, not north south, but road direction for Vitoftra, <laughs> down slope." <laughs> that was <laughs> that that was his brief. And uh, <laughs> so he's, he's a specialist in ever, so I didn't argue. You know, that was, that, th that was then. And if we look 10 years down the line, how that has changed, how we look at it now, it's, a, it's quite a, a big change how we, we, we look at things. So uh, it depends on farm to farm, I would say. Uh, and as I say, the mountains give us much of challenge on in designing. I think the interesting thing as well is, you know, if you look at... Um, <laughs> you know, the average maize farms and the size of the blocks that they are doing precision farming in, you know, six hectares starts looking very small. So, you know, everything in perspective, and, uh, you know, we mentioned it yesterday, before you can get anywhere, you need to realize what the context is that you are in. Now, we can define an industry context, but that's why I feel it's so important that when you start developing, sit with the people around you, the knowledgeable people, not one, not two, everyone, that's going to work with you down the five-year pipeline because those are the people that have certain knowledge about certain things. There's not one guy that knows everything, never. That's uh, it's, it's the way that it works. So I think, you know, I don't want to spend too much time further on it unless you have another comment. Uh, uh, just a, a thing that's, w when we started in the industry on drip, uh, on citrus, for example, it was 3.5 liters an hour. But that was the best we know 10, 15 years ago. We never thought then that we will get to a one liter or 0.7 liter an hour drip, never. Um, so Netofim is working on the dripper that's uh, giving a zero liter discharge, and then they're going to supply drones, giving each tree the right amount of water. That's precision farming. Why don't you Netofim? It's kind of vague. I like it. Uh, yes. Hello. Hello. Just one thing, uh, we talked about, the you said you, you want to make the dripper blocks bigger because you want to, uh, because you can, can, do, can make it bigger. But uh, there's a lot of other things that, it, uh, that will influence your block sizes and uh, manage the management of the block sizes, not only the dripping. And as you also said, the, the cost for, in for that extra what you call it, the uh, valve or something, I, it's, I, it's, it's a cost, but it in the end, it's almost nothing. It's uh, pocket money. I, I think the point is 6,000 Rand today for a valve um, is 20,000 in a few years' time. So <laughs> rather do it today, but manage as efficiently as you can. And I, I think, you know, I liked what came out at, uh, so far was the different soil types and the variants of soil types through orchards and we see it time and time again and especially on established farms you don't want to keep a piece open now you know in the back in the day they've just planted everything and this was a convenient block 
but now you start changing and replanting and now it's difficult to only isolate a little area i'm just going to plant that block and then move my road in a few years time and then increase that block because now i'm sticking to soil type so then it's easier to adapt the irrigation around those specific and uh, and it's it's something that we you know b uh, some of the, that 13 hectare or orchard for example um it has one main valve well three main uh, valves at the top and so you know sub valves that remain open um so on the system you just open the three valves instead of the six and we're at a point now where we're going to change it we want to open the six separately because this the six uh, um it's a little valley like that so three of the blocks down this way with roads between them three this side with roads between them so just the fact that the one is a you know e uh, uh, eastern slope and the other one a western slope um just that already uh, makes a difference because the sun and the evaporation is going to be different so just based on that we should have six valves and not three so i think it's these simple things that you need to think about but rather spend the money because you're going to be more efficient um but the problem is one inefficiency or one efficiency causes another inefficiency and and that's why we also believe you can't tell a farmer you must do this at the end of the day the farmer needs to you know be aware of the different things and decide you know what combination he's happy with on his farm with his management um, perspectives well thank you very much okay um so next quickly paul ah uh, not paul hello <laughs> pj almost the same thing um pj has been working with iran for quite a bit um i think you guys think my dad speaks a lot i think if there's one guy that gives him a go in the office it's definitely pj um no P pj uh, i think it's uh, I, I don't know what is beyond verbal diarrhea but but pj does well so <laughs> uh no pj i hope uh, i hope you prepared i think pj is just going to give us a bit of a rundown on alas bester's perspective of precision farming um and a bit of the way forward um and i think the main idea behind his uh, talk is to give the you know like i said give an idea of how cheap um uh, technology can be and the thing is how practical how practically it can be applied um and i have to compliment pj on the differences both him and Idran has made with our management systems and the innovation that they've put forward thank you Thank you, thank you, Zander. Um, for those of you th who don't know me, I'm PJ. Uh, they keep me in the back office, so I've been there for a while. <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, so today I'm just going to talk about uh, precision farming from Alice Bester's perspective. And uh, yes, so it, it's it's a lot easier to talk about precision farming if you're not actually selling a product, so that helps a lot. <laughs> so uh, my point is to get everybody involved and on the train. Uh, feel free to stop me anywhere um, if you're uncertain about a term or want more knowledge about uh, one of the things that I've mentioned. Please feel free to stop me right there and I'll explain. Uh, mo uh, most of it um, I've put into very layman's terms, but essentially what this is is just to show you guys what you can do and just break down the mental barriers that exist uh, because it might seem daunting at first but um, yeah d it's it's really it's really easy if you if you think you have a problem there's very there's most likely a way that you can use uh, precision farming to solve it uh, okay so what is precision farming according to Alice Bester? We believe that you must collect and use as much data as you can for various reasons, such as increases to productivity, efficiency, and solving problems you might not even know exist. Uh, when you start monitoring data, uh, regardless of what platform you use to monitor it, you start noticing patterns and problems that exist that you never actually even knew existed. Uh, okay, so, but wait, I'm only a small scale farmer, so this must not be applicable on me. This we think is a common misconception. Small-scale farmers think that precision farming is something only larger farming businesses do slash can afford to do and that at their small scale it's not cost effective to invest in software and hardware solutions. 
uh, this could not be further from the truth. Small-scale farmers are supposed to be the ones that are on the forefront of um, implementing more precision farming tools. Uh, because small, bigger farms can survive with inefficiencies here and there uh, because they have economics of scale that will help them offset the cost of inefficiencies. So it's, it's particularly the small farmer that should be trying to find efficiency in every little bit of corner that he can because he does not have that economy of scale to pull him through if on efficiencies. The current misconceptions, I think, or we think, um, is that it's too expensive, it's too complex, uh, you have too many systems to manage and end up managing nothing, and that it's only for large commercial, f commercial farmers. So um, let me just quickly take each one of these and um, break it down. Uh, the it's too expensive, maybe a long time ago this would have been a very true and valid argument, but electronic components have gotten much cheaper um, over the years, um, you also always had to hire someone, be it an electronical engineer or someone with some real good technical know-how um, to do this where it's no longer the case. Um, it's been made a lot easier and uh, especially some of the older farmers that have younger sons, um, you might even be able to pull them in to help you uh, set some of this up. Okay, the it's too complex. Uh, there are too many platforms, uh, there are many platforms that allow anyone with a bit of technical knowledge to develop uh, what would have been previously deemed too complex. Um, I'll get into an example of that. And also the internet is full of resources that can help you uh, build anything that you can think of. Uh, just break away the limitations uh, of what you think is possible. Uh, you have too many systems to manage and end up managing nothing. Now, this this we see a lot, where you get on a where you get on a farm, and they tell you, okay, we have this diesel program, we have this irrigation system, we have this system, we have this system. You you end up having four or five systems. All the data's there; it's all there, but the data, the systems don't talk to each other. They just talk to themselves. They do what they were intended to do, and they might do that perfectly. But now, you as a person need to go and analyze the data from each different system and then you have to make decisions. Now, you should get to a point where you don't do that. Um, you, you have the systems talking to each other. Um, that it's only for large-scale farmers. As I've said, um, smaller farmers are supposed to be the ones that um, I really think should be looking heavily into precision farming, especially if you're on a really small, y you have a really small piece of land and you need to get the maximum out of that small piece. Um, how do you implement this? Um, there are very interesting and cool tools you can use to implement this. Um, I'll, s I'll come and set them up now here. Sadly, I didn't have time to. Uh, but you can use it with a microcontroller, the one that I've, I've used in my little demo is known as an Arduino, uh, but you also get picks and the list goes on. And um, the reason why I used a Arduino is because it's really easy to program. Uh, there are tons of resources online that can help you program them. Um, it's, it's really simple. Uh, what can an Arduino slash controller do? Um, I will from here on refer to the Arduino as a controller. I just think it's easier to refer to it as a controller. Uh, well, anything that you want it to do, the sky's the limit. You can connect various sensors to the controller. You can teach your controller to behave in a way that makes it smart. Um, I'll demonstrate that in a second. Um, here's just a few examples of sensors that you can hook up to any controller that you'd like. Uh, temperature, humidity, ground moisture, pH, load, uh, load sensors being weight. Obviously, you can also um, uh, measure the load of electrical um, things as well. Different types of gases, you can get alcohol sensors and the like, and the list goes on. Uh, anything that you currently use a sensor for, you can probably get that value and use it to talk to other devices. Uh, let, let's, look at, let's have a look at a quick demonstration of a small Arduino that I'm, uh, Arduino irrigation, uh, if you just pause it quickly, don't play it yet. Um, 
when Paul said, you can do it cheap or you can do it expensive, this is cheap. Don't do this. This is, this is purely for demonstration. <laughs> don't, don't do this. Uh, but what you see there is our Arduino, and that's hooked up uh, with the Ethernet cable. So that's just a small computer. Just see that as a small computer. And it's just, um, you can play it now. Uh, it's just going to read values from, uh, you just uh, that's a relay board, and that's my pump, uh, fish tank pump that, that I bought for 140 rand. The total cost of all my components was 600 rand. So I've bought a controller, I bought a ground moisture sensor. Um, all the components that I needed was a mere 600 rand. Uh, but don't buy the uh, sensor, the ground moisture sensor that I did. Um, they are very cheap. Um, they'll give you a rough indication, but they're nowhere near uh, the spec of some of the uh, sensors that the people before me have demonstrated. I'd say invest money in a good sensor because at the end of the day that will it ju will just improve your resolution. Uh, the type of sensor that I used was quite cheap. It's 100 Rand. Uh, but it works perfectly if you just want to know um, it's dry, it's semi-wet, it's wet, or it's mud. Um, if, you, if you just want to know in that small narrow band, which most people just want to know, they just want to know in that small narrow band, um, that sensor might even work perfectly for you. So yeah, but that's just, just to highlight how cheap it was to make this. It just cost 600 Rand. Okay, you can play it further, and I'm going to stick it into the ground, and you can see it in action. Uh, stuck it in the ground, and da-da-da-da. Water starts dripping out. That's my drip irrigation system, very highly complex. Um, it works with a fish tank pump. Pl pressure regulated fish tank pump costs 140 bucks. Uh, but uh, I didn't include it in the video, but how that moisture sensor is currently programmed, or the controller is programmed, is this you see the swell on the left. It, it's slightly more moist. Now, the moment that I'll pull it, that I'm gonna if I pull it out of that bowl and put it into the bowl that's more moist, immediately the controller will sense that um, the ground is saturated and it will switch off the pump um, because the ground is now saturated. And um, moving on. But how do I read and analyze this data? Um, this is a very valid point because that temperature sensor, it stores values in uh, numbers. And I mean, if, you'd, if I dump a bunch of numbers um, on a text pad note for you, you'll have no way of reading that. It just, it's just unreadable. Um, so sometimes you just have to be very careful with collecting mass amounts of data because it seems very appealing because the more data you have, the more decisions you can make down the road. But that can be very mis mis misleading because it, it means nothing. You can collect all the data in the world you want. If you can't analyze it, it really means nothing to you. But depending on what your needs, uh, what de what depending on what needs to be done, one solution would be to have your controller talk to third party services that can give you an easy way um, of understanding and viewing what's um, happening. So with that small temperature, I mean that small ground moisture sensor of mine, um, I hooked it up to a third party um, service that you feed it data and it analyzes it for you and just shows it to you in a human readable format. Um, an example here is um, I use ThinkSpeak um, it's very straightforward to use. There's a library for it for the Arduino. You can build this with very little technical know-how. As you can see, uh, before the irrigation started, it started there at a, at a zero value. It went up to just above a 200 value, and then it started going down again. Now, the moment it went above that 200 value was when the pump switched itself on, and then um, once the pump was running, the ground got more saturated and it dropped to below the threshold and the pump switched itself off. And now you can see some time frame th at the bottom. You'll see there's a, uh, just make a laser, Never mind. Um, there's timestamps at the bottom. So all any data that you can think of that you want to graph over time, you can use this tool and this is free. This is absolutely free. ThingSpeak um, is free. You can make an account. You can hook sensors up to it. You can send your data. You can use it. 
and it's absolutely free, it costs nothing. Uh, but what about other integrations? Uh, this is the nice thing about uh, precision farming and IoT, is um, you have to start thinking of wider things. Um, for example, I, I had my controller, whenever it switches on the pump, it tweets it. Um, it sends me a tweet to say the pump was just switched on. But obviously the list is endless. You can, any, any other service that you like to use, think uh, whether it be social media, be it be anything, um, you can have your controller be a human. It can, um, it can really be a very clever thing if you teach it to. Uh, now, if you look at what else is possible, here I'll, um, I'll hover over a bit. This is, I think, my last slide. So, um, Now, basically what we at Alice Best do is we build our own systems to, to do whatever uh, function we, we deem necessary. And like Zander mentioned, we do our own problem solving. Zander will come to me with a production issue. Um, he'll tell it to Adrian. Uh, we brainstorm a solution and we custom build, build our own solutions from the ground up. The nice thing about that is you you are not limited to anything. And that's what the point we want to get across is uh, we want farmers to start thinking about precision farming, not just as measuring soil content or measuring one thing or one aspect. Uh, we want you to think of a whole variety of things, the entire process through, and log as much data, keep as much data as you can, uh, because at the end of the day, you'll use that data um, to process, make business decisions. So just a few examples um, of what you can do is you can embed RFID tags into your trees to allow uh, to allow to record individual tree records. As uh, they've mentioned, um, they're working on something to do it even by tree level. So someone is working on that, but that's entirely possible. Um, another thing that's entirely possible, maybe one day, uh, with GMOs, you can actually genetically uh, make your tree react in a certain way. Um, it, whether it be you, if you apply a certain light to your tree, it can actually uh, talk to other electronic devices. That's also entirely within the scope of possibilities. You can have automated clocking in for farm workers based on their location. Um, we uh, didn't. I did a small test the other day. I bought a phone uh, for 400 rand. It's a very cheap smartphone, but it has a location GPS inside. Uh, GSM module, so it can connect to a cell phone network. And if you just think about that practically for a second, you can enroll a phone to each farm worker, and the moment he walks into the farm or to a certain place, based on their location, you can do clock-ins, you can do time of arrival for activities. The list is really endless. You, you want people to start thinking about these things more in depth and not just, oh, I'll have a system to do my clocking. Oh, I'll have a system to do my wages. You want the clocking system to work with your wages system, and you want that integration. You don't want to manage, like I said previously, four or five systems, each doing that one thing it was intended to do. You want them all to talk to each other. Um, so yes, that's the track progress across various processes with sensors and data. Another interesting thing um, that's not really been implemented yet, I think, fully, is called machine learning. And machine learning might seem like a very weird word, but essentially comes down to artificial intelligence, where you start learning a computer how to think for itself. Traditionally, you as a programmer, you teach a computer how to think, and it can only think in that way, only that way. Whereas machine learning, you can teach, um, you can teach a certain uh, tractor. I'm going to take a tractor. You can treat. You can teach a tractor what is how. What is good behavior? What is bad behavior? And then it it goes. It it works like a human does. You make it works. Go, it goes trial and error, trial and error until it stand understands completely what is good behavior and bad behavior. And uh, it can use good behavior to make new generations of itself. And eventually, you can have a tractor that just stands in your storeroom and goes from standing 
to fully operating itself because it knows how to work itself. It worked it out by itself. No one had to program it to work in a certain way. It taught itself how to work in a certain way. Another interesting thing is you can monitor weather, weather forecast information and have your controller ask, your ask you whether or not you still want to irrigate. Um, I'm just throwing out a bunch of ideas here of things that I thought of, but obviously the list is endless. You want all your systems to talk to each other and ask you, hey, I've noticed this. Do you want this? Do you still want this to happen? Do you don't want this to happen anymore? Um, or you can also have it suggest you things. Do you I, I suggest you do this. But you as a farmer, you can still have that authority to make that final call. Yes, I want you to do this or no, don't. And uh, yeah, the, the list really is endless. Um, you can go on and uh, do so much more. But uh, essentially, that's my, that's my take on it. I think we should PJ out of let PJ out of his cage more often. Thanks, PJ. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I think if I can just add to that, and perhaps PJ, if you hang around, perhaps you want to make a few com comments. Yeah. Um, you know, a few things that they've already managed is they've already started monitoring our, our diesel usage, and I think the next level will be, again, perhaps with RFID and GPS technology to start monitoring the tractor movements on the farm and what specific diesel usage was by which specific driver on which specific tractor in which specific orchard. Um, also, all other movements um, on the farm from, from farm level down to orchard level, down to tree level, down to labor level. Um, and then I think, as you mentioned, correlations is very important. Um, my opinion, precision farming means nothing if you can't correlate it against something and it's not always just a case of fertilizer against um, against crop um, you know somewhere I in between is whatever you spray on your trees and also what the labor does uh, your pruning also has an effect on production so if precision farming doesn't monitor pruning then I say we're not really at the point that we have precision farming yet precision farming uh, is all the activities on your farm Precision farming, in my opinion, and in our best opinion, is um, monitoring every single activity on your farm and actually getting down to micromanagement. And I want to add to what PJ said about small farmers. It is easier for a small farmer to apply precision farming. Precision farming is not necessarily something that technology does for you. Precision farming means I have the ability to manage on a tree-to-tree -tree basis. So a person with one hectare versus a person with 300 hectares will be more efficient with his pruning just on the basis that he's observing what he's doing and correlating against something. I think people are scared of doing um, data analysis, da data capturing, and I think that's where, where technology comes in um, and could assist them. And again, uh, there's no reason why there can't be collaborative you know, environments where people can work together in developing specific things. There's no n use, like PJ mentioned, to go and invent a soil moisture probe that are on the market. Let's rather focus on the things that aren't on the market, such as proper you know, movement technology on the farm. Um, you know, even um, at the moment, the way that I work is um, if I... Um, if we go into the rainy season and I want to know where my weeds are, I send people out on a weekly basis. Um, they need to go through the whole farm on the same day of the week, um, scout all the orchards for weeds. It's a basic five-point scale, and um, that information is fed into the program. Uh, it's just a normal GIS map. You go into it and you can see... Um, which orchard is on what level. My basic scale is a one to three, I can still spray. If it's a four or a five, then I need to put a brush cutter in because then I have weeds this high and I don't want filthy orchards. And even then I start shouting at the managers because they didn't get the job done. So then it's a case where I can sit overseas and monitor what my weeds are like. So I don't even, I'm not seeing photos of the orchard. They can add photos if they want but I'm happy to know whether the tasks are up to date or not. The same, um, and you can track the movement. So the guy's not sitting under a tree somewhere because it's GPS based. They're moving through the orchard so you can see the little dots everywhere where they did make a scouting. 
Um, so you reach a point as well where it's not one scouting per orchard, you know, there's different pieces of the orchards where weeds grow more often. So it's different things. Uh, orchard scout, uh, orchard, um, uh, you know, estimates, um, they do that already. And also insect scouting, um, we've also started integrating into the system. So, and, and the nice thing which PJ can maybe comment on is once you have one system in terms of scouting, then everything else that is scouting just piggybacks on that first thing. So it's the same yeah. programming. And um, yeah, I think I didn't mention it, um, but if you want to know what PJ's profession is, um, you'll realize that he didn't say this or that, he said this slash that. So programmers tend to <laughs> express everything in expressions. So <laughs> um, PJ's uh, profession is, uh, let's call it a programmer, if I keep it simple. Um, but I think um, his knowledge of that is brilliant. And I think that's a big advantage. Thank you. Uh, just to add to what Zander said, um, I'm going to take his first example of, let's say, the diesel, the diesel system and the tracking. Let's say most people already have some other form of diesel system and some other form of tracking. You either have C-Track or car track or whatever in your tractors already. Now you have two systems that you already have. Uh, yes, you can go to someone and you'll he can make you a custom solution uh, that will do both, but they w why should you not think about having just the two talk to each other? Because there's nothing that stops you. If you have a dis diesel system that you built yourself or someone built for you, uh, whenever they pour in diesel, a some other controller can monitor the movements on the tracking system and once it sees that this vehicle has reached, uh, let's say, you know this vehicle can do 500 kilometers on a tank. The moment that it reaches 400 kilometers on the odometer, you can have the tracking system tell the diesel system, listen, this, this vehicle, it has to come in for fuel and be ready for it, uh, especially if you're working with big trucks and so forth, that you have enough diesel on hand to feed that demand. Uh, but this is just a small, simple example of what can be done. I think the thing that I want to get across today is that whatever you think is possible, it is possible. And you can make it. It's not expensive. It's not complex. Just add a little bit of ingenuity and you can build yourself a really good working system. Not the best. You won't get a 100% solution. You'll get a very good 90% solution at a very low cost and it will improve your efficiency for sure. And a 90% system is better than nothing. So don't it, it's don't better than Excel. Nothing. Yeah. It's better than Excel. <laughs> Anything's better than Excel. I, <laughs> I know um, there's some Excel guys sitting here. Yeah. Oh no, he's going to see our spreadsheets. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I uh, don't know whether there's any other questions or comments for PJ. Okay, questions? then um, I think. Thank you. My question is more based on the fuel system. I have got fleet and I, I still use the old fashioned one. That means I have a logbook. I keep the receipt of uh, from the fuel station. You trust a lot of people. No, <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's the reason why I said uh, I'm interested in your system. Say for example, uh, I know that uh, for a 2.5, uh, diesel motor, uh, uh, it gives me 500 kilos of uh, 70 liters of diesel. Mm -hmm. And then I said I spent 1,000 rand divided by the kilos I spent. And then per kilos, I know how much I spent. But the only uh, things I'm interested in is uh, my system, which have got lots of filing. I end up having this kind of filing. Sometimes one fleet is missing. Sometimes uh, I've got different cars, but different drivers. I'm not so sure if the uh, other one drained. Do you want me to make a suggestion for you of what you can do? Yeah, because mine is very much tricky. What? It only work when it's been done by me. But yes. by, by my workers, it's complete chaos. No. I can do it myself. I do it in my cars. 
it, it is working well, but when I give it to my workers, it's miserable. Yes. Now, what you, what you can do to solve your problem, and I'll keep it very simple, layman's terms, as much as I can, uh, because maybe there's some other people here as well that have the same problem with diesel, that you have a tank on the farm and you have a logbook, and you trust people with that logbook, and that can be a very slippery slope. And before you know it, you just write off numbers as, oh, no, maybe that was an inaccurate diesel reading or, or so forth, and you won't even know. Uh, what you could do is uh, you set yourself up a small database server in your office close to your tank. You have a controller at your diesel tank. You have a RFID reader and you have RFID tags. Have you, do you know what an RFID tag is? Those small tags that sussle uh, right before they pour petrol or diesel into your car, they'll put it against the pump. That identifies the, the person operating the pump. Now. You build a reader, you have an RFID tag. Uh, once the worker um, wants to do a diesel uh, entry, he scans himself in, he scans the vehicle that it's going into, it opens up a solenoid, it starts up the, the diesel pump, it pumps the diesel. Once he's finished and he removes the nozzle, um, the entry is saved, and then you know Im immediately which worker uh, put how much diesels, how much liters of diesel into which vehicle, on what date and time, and you have all the data, but systems like that already exist. You can go and pick them off the shelf. I just can't name you one off the top of my head, but that's how they will work. Okay. That um, answers the question. Anything else? Okay, um, we just want to make a suggestion. Um, we want to suggest that we quickly break for, for I almost said dinner again, breakfast. Still thinking about last night's nice food. Um, yeah, so quickly break for breakfast. Um, I think the next uh, two talks will uh, need some brain power. I think everyone's taking a bit of a dip. Um, so I think what we'll do is quickly break, come back, um, because the fertilizer specifically as well um, might need some brain power, and I think you guys need to feel fresh. I don't know if everyone is in agreement. Happy, um, and then we'll. What we'll do is just shorten a bit on the cultivars, um, just condense it so that we get proper info, but obviously a bit shorter. But I think let's try and adapt and just do everything properly. Okay, thank you.
All right, uh, sorry, I just want to get going. I know everyone's not in here already, but I asked Donovan to get everyone in. Um, but I think we should get going because we're definitely going to run out of time. Um, so firstly, uh, now, I think if there's an example of, firstly, our research should be done, and secondly, of how anyone that does research on your farm um, on behalf of a company should do it, then uh, Quibus is definitely the example um, that's leading the way. Um, I really have to compliment Quibus for firstly um, his professionalism and secondly, um, although we help him to collect the samples and everything, he doesn't leave it to me to remember about it. He makes sure that it's collected and he phones and follows up. and. Um, speaks directly to the farm managers and gets the job done. I think a lot of prob uh, problems with outside research is it's done, um, but it's not followed up, and that causes a lot of uh, problems. So, Kubis, I want to thank you for that. And I think it's good work that you're doing, and we've had a few good discussions. Um, but yeah, take the floor. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, or like whether it's afternoon or good morning, I don't know. I don't wear my watch anymore, so if I'm late, I uh, apologize. And if I go over my time, I apologize as well. Um, I think we are ruled too much by time. However, when you do research, time is also always a problem because you would like to have results ASAP. And I think in terms of what's going on in South African industry, um, this is a good example. Um, this is exactly what we are facing. Uh, there's a fire and uh, you need to extinguish it and that's the MRL conundrum. That is the conundrum and the problem that we sit with. I also want to say I've realized that this is a workshop, so I hope that I have a lot of questions and I see there's a lot of clever people here and people with a lot of papers behind their names. Um, and. Your input is valuable. Um, I think the industry, in terms of the MRL conundrum, um, the whole industry and everybody needs to work together to solve this problem. I'm not going to focus too much on my research as well, though. I'm going to tell you about the research and show you in some interesting new stats. If you were at the Saga Symposium two weeks ago, you would have seen some of the research that I've done. and. Since then, new information came forth, or new data, and I've processed the data, and there's a few things that I find very interesting. I would like actually to know from uh, uh, Dr. Duarte if they also have kind of like uh, MRL problems in Peru and challenges with that. Well, that's, well, that's the first interesting thing that I... Well, that is no rain, but I thought maybe the rivers could have spread it or whatever. Um, very interesting. So then uh, I think the research won't really have involve you guys much. But the big, big question is, what is Phytophthora? I've realized that this is a very stupid question because everybody sitting here growing avos would know what is a Phytophthora. If I ask anyone here what is Phytophthora, they would have their own ideas, but everybody agrees that it's something that Charles might tree. That is the biggest answer normally I get from a farmer. It kills my tree, and you need to sort it out. So I'm going to start there, that it's a water fungus, homeocytes. Um, the whole scenario around that, what it is, that organism down there, uh, what is it? That one, that's the bugger. Um, and the avos, we work on a phytophthora and a um, And that's a lot of stuff that I've said there, exactly how it works and how it swam and what, what. But I thought I will just put it in here to give you an idea what it is. And I got a lot of the data of 
Well, Saga sent a few months last year some data over in the South African, well, the Australians as well, they've sent data around Phytophthora. There you can get some idea how it moves or what it does. Um, there's a nice picture as well that the Australians put together exactly how it moves in the ground. But what is important about this Phytophthora cinnamomy to realize, and we're going to discuss that whole process, is that it moves through your soil and it moves in water. We found a lot of uh, Phytophthora in water as well, and it is a bit of a problem, especially if you've got lands where, you or, or where you've got soil that really don't have Phytophthora in. Um, here in this area, in Sunin area, there is areas that you won't find Phytophthora in the soil. Um, found that very interesting. Um, some places I've done studies on, I haven't found Phytophthora at all in the soil. So, what is the current treatments of Phytophthora? I think you guys can add on, because when we talk about MRLs, the reason why we're talking about MRLs is injections. There you have ethyl phosphonic acid and acetyl aluminium. I'm going to keep it that. That is the that is the problem for everyone talking about MRL. That one. Um, now, when we have us at the the MRL study group, the phosphonate study group or action group of Saga, we we got a lot of input. So this is nothing new to those people who are part of the were uh, part of that study group or action group. But the main thing is, is everybody asks me from every farm, all the farmers ask the same question: Is it dangerous to humans? Why is there MRLs? Well, I'm going to answer you. I will, and also something that Professor Dan said: No, there, there is no evidence yet that is harmful to human beings. So why is there MRLs? It's a good question. All right, it's a good question. Why is there MRLs? But the main thing that I, I do understand is that Europeans associate this, the phosphonates, with pesticides. Because certain pesticides break up, and they are afraid that it's going to be harmful to, to humans. So anything that they see here is a problem. And that's where your problem lies. It's not in itself that is dangerous. Um, I think somebody went and measured the amount of phosphonates in Coca-Cola, and they found that it's three times as high as the MRLs. What we in South Africa have to contend with. Also, another thing that we have to contend with, uh, also if you look at meat, there's some phosphonates in meat as well. Um, so I've heard all the arguments before, and it's the truth. The fact of the matter is, we can discuss it later, we need to approach it but differently. Um, we have an MRL problem, there is a conundrum, and we need to solve it. Either with product, or the way you form, or with negotiations and engagement of the European Union. So this is not a just a problem that, because I'm now angry with the world, they have to change. It's a, it's a serious problem, and it's a problem that affects your pockets, so it's a problem we need to address professionally and in the right way. You get foliar sprays. I was very excited to see Professor McLeod with their research so far on, 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 um, on the foliar sprays. The problem that they still have is that it does not solve necessarily the MRLs, in your trees, but it, it, that it is effective. It does look like it's effective and it excites me because now you have another way of phytophthora control other than injections. And I will get to, 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 to what I'm getting to because I want us to think about more than just the, you know, agricultural reps and businessmen all have one thing in their mind, and that is to make money, which is probably the reason why you went entered into business. But if you look at the bigger picture, there's a big enough cake for everybody to start eating from. And I don't want to run ahead of myself, but as everybody working together, I think there's a space for everyone to put 
or add something to solve a specific big problem in South Africa. It doesn't well, this is not going to help if we work, not work together, but work against each other. Then there's a uh, swell drench with ethyl phosphonic acid and acetyl aluminium. I'll get to that. That's the research I'm doing. Um, I like to say it, so don't be, don't be angry. But uh, you said I'm putting my, uh, pushing my head into a beehive. Um, and I'm, I'm continuing with that because we need to have more answers and we need to have more actual data and facts. In 1992, there was a study being done in Australia by adding just normal phosphorus acid to the soil and I found it very interesting that they didn't get any results. That's why it's in terms of consistent results and it's also in terms of what did they use. Now obviously, technology does not stand still. So we need to adapt it with technology. We need to see what is easier, what is difficult. And that's what we've done. I, um, I've worked on a specific formulation and uh, as a swell drench, and I looked at it, and we get interesting results. And we're sharing the results because I want to be part of the solution, not part of the problem. Obviously, compost and mulching does definitely help. Uh, Trichoderma, there's some people that also say mycorrhiza or whatever they use. I believe in the bi biologi uh, biological agents. Indeed, they do help. Silicate, there is some research being done by uh, um, near Mr. Becker or Dr. Becker, or whatever, I don't know what his title is. But anyway, there was, was in research being done 2007 and 2014 around silicate. I think also uh, Professor Dan said there's a uh, huge research being done in Australia around that. Um, it's stuff that we can look at. We need to look at that. We need to see what are we going to do in terms of the future. The question, the main question that I want to ask you guys is why, what is stopping us from using all of them. What is stopping us from incorporating some of them? Is our way of application correct? We apply it according to the label, understand that, but what about instead of four folio apps doing two folio apps and an injection later? or a little bit in small injection, or a small swell drench, or some silicate, mixing things up. Have anybody done research on that? No, nobody have done, because we focus on a specific way of research. We focus on one specific way, either foliar sp sprays. And yeah, you on the farm, you have the opportunity to do a lot of research around that. But there's a basket of information of treatment of phytophthora. And if you look at the bottom three that I definitely do know, None of them contains any phosphonates. So there's a vast, I don't say go now and switch a whole farm to, to these treatments because there's no registered products on them yet for um, Phytophthora. What I'm saying is start testing, looking, making preparation, let your mind go. How do I go about this problem, this challenge that we are facing? Um, because what you see here is there's a huge basket of things. Um, I, maybe there is some research about injections. E injections is very expensive, so it's difficult to do a little bit at a time. Foliar sprays is but cheaper, I guess, if you do a little bit at a time. Swell drench, also but cheaper if you do a little bit on time. What is the problem? Oh well, will it work? What is the result? Won't it be much better to do it that way than just work on the flushes? I don't know. Look, the most, the biggest, the most data says, yeah, you do it in your flushes, your autumn and your spring flush. That's when you do it. But I just want your mind to wander a bit. The mind of a researcher is always thinking and questioning. So I'm questioning a lot of things. So bear with me. I guess I've got the right to question. 
So what is the current problems of phytophthora treatments? There you are, in the MRLs, I've discussed it with you. Are these PMPMs, har PPMs harmful? Now I've discussed it with you. Um, minimum effective PPM against phytophthora, we don't know. There's studies done in 1994, and there were studies done, done in 1992 in Australia. 1992 Australia studies said about 20, p 20, 20 to 40 PPMs. Uh, studies in South Africa in glass houses spoke about 10 to 50 PPM, and you'll get some phytophthora resistance or resistance against the phytophthora for the tree. Um, there was mention at the Saga Symposium about um, basically mildew, sp specific mildews. However, I don't think I want to go on mildew to give me a, a to give me an idea what Phytophthora on AVA is going to do. I think we do have to do more research around that. What is the minimum PPM of your phosphonates on your roots? And I'm talking about field trials. Um, we don't know. Um, I know Professor Dunn said currently in Australia the norm is about 40 ppm. Uh, it seems that Professor McLeod might think is maybe more, but I want to know if there's empirical data that substantiate our minimum ppm ratios. Also, when I'm looking at your phytophthora control, I want to ask a specific question also, just to lose your mind. Uh, Ain't it better to prevent the phytophthora than and control the phytophthora than to start rehabilitating your phytophthora field? So many of us try to save costs and you neglect your phytophthora treatment, which is quite ridiculous because the phytophthora treatment is the most important treatment there is because that is the one that makes sure that your roots can take up nutrients so that you can have a yield. So if you don't use a phytophthora treatment, you are in trouble. So why do you cut on the most important thing? It's like taking away oxygen from a human being. It, it does not work. So um, it's better to, yeah, if you inherit a phytophthora tree that, that or bought a field that is now neglected for years, yes, then we need to Rehabil uh, rehabilitate that specific tree or trees. But we need to address the problem before it happens. Uh, many people let the problem linger for too long and say, I don't have phytophthora, so I don't need to control phytophthora. Well, congratulations, you're going to have problems. We are welcome to discuss it later, but you're going to have problems sooner or later. That's part of your precision management. I think we, are, we spoke a lot of precision management, and we need to, that must be part of your precision management. Also, I believe also certain trees do not need the application necessary, always necessary for, for, um, for its health. I believe also when you look at your trees, you will have to look at your tree health and whether the tree is under stress and what's the input impact of stress on the phytophthora. The higher stress, the bigger the impact of phytophthora on the tree. So I just want our minds to start wandering around these questions. This is a workshop, so uh, we I want our minds to work around it. I'm not here to give answers today. I give you some directions, but there's, there's things we need to figure out. Uh, maybe there is a lot of things that we already figured out, but the research data is somewhere locked up in the public uh, bib at the university. That scares me more because it says it's not really accessible to the farmer today and we need to make more research accessible to the farmer today and more understandable. I'm not saying the farmer is stupid, I'm just saying some of the research data I've worked through, I also wondered what, what I was reading. More reading friendly, stuff that you all can understand. So, do we know the movement of the phosphonates? Injections. Um, people say, well, if it moves in it, if you inject this, people will say there's also some scientific evidence, goes into the leaves, maybe in the fruit, then to the roots, or goes down to the root, go back to the, uh, to the leaves. Um, spoke to Professor McLeod, I think, Pete, you guys probably will know more about the folia apps, but as far as I understand, it's also first leaves and then roots, then back to the fruits and leaves. 
Um, that's the whole process. Um, quite interesting research uh, that as well. When you look at, uh, hello. Great, roots. <laughs> All right, so what we did was, and I'm just going to say a few things on the experimental experiments we would, or research we're busy with at Alles Base. As you see yesterday when we visited Himor, um, that one, uh, we drove actually one of our, my signage where we're doing research. Um, I do research basically on your three root stocks. Bounty, Duke 7, and Dusa, all on the Maluma has, seeing if I can figure out whether whether the roots does take up the phosphonate product that, that we've developed. But not only that, what is the movement of those phosphonates then? Is it moving straight through the fruit? Is it moving up into the leaves? Where is it going? Because at the end of the day, I want to know, I want the phosphonates basically in the roots. That's the best place for phosphonates to be because the phosphonates are actively fighting against the phytophthora in the soil. So that's where you want your phosphonates. So that is the research I've done. What we did was we took a control, uh, three, three lanes or three rows. Uh, we took three, th three rows of um, Bounty and Duke 7 and uh, DUSA rootstocks and we see how differently those rootstocks react because when you do swell drenches you start realizing that probably the movement of your phosphonates will be different than a folia app or injection and with that data I want to continue and see uh, does the phosphonates end up into the fruit yes or not Probably yes, probably no, I don't know. Because that would be guesswork and assumptions, and we have done a lot of assumptions the past year over so many things. So I asked Averman to join me here. And uh, this is data, current data, and it's that I currently have. Sorry for the small print, but it's, I don't know, I'm going to fit everything in after a year. But here you look at basically the leaves that we took on the 27th of October, 2016, all right? So I didn't apply anything, it, nothing was applied. That was probably from the previous uh, Alouette treatment that was done on those specific blocks. And there you can see that the leaves show still a high amount of phosphonates it's not really a crisis amount, but it's in, in connection with the rest or in relation with the less rest, there is a huge difference. So if I look at my leaf after the application, my application was done on the 27th of November 2016. And I took a leaf sample on the 19th, well, the 15th of December. You'll see that all, all my leaves at the top and at the bottom uh, shows a decrease, okay, a huge decrease. So some the phosphonates went somewhere. Either it dissolved in the tree with energy processes because there was a flush, which is possible, and or it went to the fruit or and both and it went to the roots. Well, did it went to the roots? No. If you look at your roots, um, yeah, okay, I don't have my roots control here, sorry. Um, but if you look at your roots, control roots, you'll see that there wasn't really a, um, there was actually no movement up or down into the roots from here. I'm not saying it doesn't move the roots. I'm just saying when I took the roots on the control, there was still no movement. And I didn't add the control here and specifically because this thing is now really getting big. But if you look at the control, you will find that there is actually still no phosphonates in the roots. So the only way that whether the phosphonates went was probably into the leaves and into the growth. So here on the in January, uh, December on the roots, you'll start seeing that 
there was an increase, an uptake of the product on the 15th. And then also, if you look at your DUSA there on the 15th, it moved from 21 to 52 in January. My bounties went from 11 to 41. And here my Duke 7 it stays the same, which I still find very interesting. Because if I look at my other blocks that I've also done that I didn't add here, it's clear that it moved from 11 to 40 as well. So why this Duke 7 row is not reacting, I don't know. But hopefully I will find out why it is uh, um, currently doing what it does. However, you still see on my leaves here, yeah, it still correlates with the leaves here. So my December leaves and my January leaves are still correlating with each other. So it's clear that there was still no movement of the phosphonates upwards to the leaves um, after basically a month and a half, two months. So I took another sample to see whether the where this is now going, where these phosphonates are mo moving and whether this will now also start picking up or start stabilizing and what's going to happen with that guy. Um, however, I'm very excited about this because it tells me something about we applied the product outside the normal root flush time. There was no root flush at that stage. So and the uptake was there, it was very efficient in a time where there was no root flush. Also, we are very curious to see what's going to happen after the next application now in at the root flush in April, May. Also to see what the MRL is doing, going to do. Also what we're going to do now is we're going to take fruit samples from this month to see what's my MRLs and measure my MRL fruit samples from March all the way to picking in May to see if there was indeed an uh, increase and how much was the increase. Um, a very important thing that uh, Dr. Adams, Adams also said was that um, I must not try to push the research in a specific direction. That is very exciting and there is possibly a need for a soil drench. I'm not and I'm not going to push it in a direction, but it's quite interesting. And that's why I'm freely giving the data over, because it gets your mind going around the phytophthora and the MRLs. And that could be that uh, basically your swell drench could be uh, solving the problem of the MRLs, because you can maybe put a bit little, uh, put less on a regular basis because it's easier and cheaper. I don't know. I'm just hypothesizing but let your minds go around. So what about a treatment basket? I spoke about it. Should we look at only one treatment? No. That's in other words, injection, polio app, or whatever the case may be. Should we only look at one? I don't think so. I think we should start incorporating more. Should we use other treatments? For sure. Should we engage more with the suppliers? Yes, please. I think that is a very important thing. We should start getting more suppliers around the table, trying to sort a few things out. Um, in Afrikaans, got a specific saying, maybe we must work more effectively with other guys. I mean. There's always place to, or sp a place and a space to work with other guys with other treatments. Saying, listen, let's do a folia app, and we're going to do a swell drench, or we're going to do an um, injection, and we're going to do a this, and we're going to do that, and start incorporating it. And I think we will probably have more success and doing more research together. I know we all want to make money, suppliers, but really, let's start to solve a problem here. Should we engage more with the EU? I think so. And I think uh, from the SARGA's point of view, uh, out of the last action um, committee meeting, we did discuss, of, uh, the discuss engaging with the EU and talking about the MRLs. Indeed, we should. Should we do further research? I think from this discussion and from what I've done was, yes, you can see that there's a huge need for further research. Huge. But it must be useful research, stuff that we must start to get answers of. I think it's important. Thank you for your time.
Okay, any questions for Quibus? Hoe lang na jou inspuiting het jy die blaarmonster geneem? My inspuiting? Ja. My sweldrange? Nee, jou inspuiting. Jy het nog inspuitings gedoen in die proewe. Nee, ek het nie die inspuitings gedoen nie. Die inspuitings was gedoen, as ek recht kan onthou, het jy vir my gesê, maart of my, ja. It's about two months before, and I just asked, when did we do the injections? We didn't do injections, we actually did a paint, early head paint. Okay, so you, your results of your flow was on the paint? Yes. On the early head paint? Yes. Okay. Just on the control. Okay. I think just uh, one thing to point out that might have caused, and Kubis and I actually didn't have much time to talk about the data, um, which I realized now was the DUSA level that was so high was it's uh, in the bottom part of the orchard. You'll remember the deuces are right at the bottom. And um, it was also planted after the first orchard. So the bounty and the Duke 7 trial is at the top um, and the deuce at the bottom. And uh, the thing that happened there is the deuces, some of them are running down into the slope. So I think also what happened there is we did a soil drench there. Now we can never look at the dates, but I think some of those dusa trees might have fallen into that because we selected the area and ba we ba basically went and soil drenched that area. So that might be the only reason that the dusa had a spike um, in the reading. Yeah, I think also, but uh, you can clearly see with your bounty, you had a very even growth that you can get from 11 to a 41. From a 21 to a 50, I think it's fair enough to say. But also, want to say around that is also we, the impact that drip irrigation will have, I think is also going to be used. I'm not going to market Mineta from, but I've, <laughs> all the, <laughs> the guys. But I'm just saying, what type of irrigation is probably going to have a huge influence in your drip well drains as well, and one should think about that as well, also in terms of your slope. And there's things that we don't know of yet. We don't have data on that, but there's indeed a also influence on that. Yeah, I think um, uh, I can't now recall whether you've actually explained the trial um, in more extent. The unfortunate thing is if we want to do comparisons between the rootstocks, the only available block is a micro block flatland, um, high density, and then the other two orchards he is um, doing applications on is the second oldest Maluma orchard. So that's basically, I think, 19 years old now. So we want to see whether we can get some results there. But because we're doing a soil drench, it's easier to do the whole block. So there it's more a scenario of what the change over time is and whether we're happy with, with a soil drench as a option. And then also a full block um, ridge where we have the trellis systems. Um, that's also through the drip irrigation on ridge. So that also rather results over time than uh, compared to a control. Um, we do have the option of the block next door to that with the microclones that we planted now to perhaps uh, compare the two over time, but obviously that will require the uh, microclones to catch up in fruit size, uh, tree size. Um, then uh, I don't know whether you want to comment on something there otherwise. Yeah, so um, I think just again, I've mentioned it a few times, but to me, this whole scenario again is uh, in terms of, you know, again, our human nature is to do try and doctor something to get right. So we get a headache and we drink pills and later on one pill is not enough, two pills is needed and your headache gets worse and worse and worse. But in the meantime, the main reason behind your headache is you're sitting behind a table for nine hours a day. You get home, eat lunch, and then you get in behind your laptop again and you work even more. And then you go to bed and you take your iPad and you sit and you read on your iPad with your neck bent like this. So tomorrow morning you wake up with um, headache. And now you're doing headache pills again. And um, I think our nature again is not uh, to go and see what the root of the cause is. And I think by by first, you know, I don't think phytophthora control will go away. That's not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is if we can get our stress down by sorting out our irrigation, by sorting out our land prep, um, 
and other causes my or that we might not know of yet. Um, perhaps in the future, one of the options could be water treatment. Um, it might be expensive, but if MRL is the limitation, then water treatments might be it. I, I, I don't know. I'm throwing around ideas. It's the same as uh, Quibus is doing. And I, I think the important thing that he said is um, this is an issue that affects all the companies that have products for root, um, you know, for root improvement or for phytophthora control. So I don't believe it's, it's on one company to solve it. I think the companies need to sit around the table and sort it out. And the only responsibility we as farmers can take for it is to try and see how we improve our, our orchard practices in terms of that. Um, yeah, and I think just one other note is I think we're working on too many hunches um, instead of action. Um, and I think that it comes down to what I've just said. And um, yeah, I just want to make sure I don't miss anything here. Yeah, just for interest, like I saw a, um, a documentary the other day about chemicals and chemical companies around the world. And obviously a lot of names were thrown around the chemicals in food, the chemical in baby bottles, the chemicals in everything. And obviously a lot of it is uh, how do chemicals compare to, you know, us and the frequency of cancer arising and everything. And um, they did analysis on a newborn infant, newborn baby. And um, they literally, um, oh, what is a null string? Umbilical cord. Um, and so they, they took samples and they found 400 different chemicals um, that was already in a newborn baby. So if you look at the extent of that, you can understand that there are issues and things like MRLs. Um, I think the, the one of the saddest things is it sends a shock through the society, um, but society also doesn't always really grasp what it's about and they focus on the wrong things as well. And like you mentioned, you know, uh, we all drink Coke. <laughs> Here's mine. So um, I think, you know, <laughs> it's uh, I there's so many other things that we should also be focusing on. And I think a lot of the consumers and a lot of the researchers also don't focus their food research and chemical research um, where they should. They, they, they all still drink their Coke, and that's why they don't worry about it. Okay, um, just waiting for... My dad? Yeah, any questions? I think if I can add to that and also add, uh, I think Quibus referred to it more or less. Um, it's almost step one, in my opinion, is what is the best practices at the moment? If you want to, you know, do less phytophthora control, step one is to get all the farmers to improve on the irrigation. Um, thumb suck like that, I say 60, 70 percent of the farmers in our industry over irrigate. I think there's still orchards on our own farms where we over irrigate, and I'm down to 20 liters per tree, a, you know, a week in some cases. So I don't think we fully grasp how little water we can put on our trees. Step one, step two, tree, or, uh, you know, management. And I think, you know, uh, I don't want to take the floor and say this is my best practice list. I think, like you say, you know. Um, I think, and that's why I mentioned hunches, you know, everyone's throwing around hunches and industry is jumping this way and that way. 
Well, I believe if we sat down as a group of farmers and a group of, uh, you know, um, input suppliers, um, we would probably sit down and compile a nice little list of what's basics in controlling phytophthora. And then while we do that, and, and that's something that Kuba has neglected to men uh, mention, is his next step now is um, going to take fruit samples each week now and do the MRL analysis and see what the change is over time. And one of the things that we mentioned as well is, you know, we start, um, our, our fruit starts setting earlier and earlier. Um, you know, we're at a point where we start setting fruit in mid in ju July. And that's the time you also do an application. You know, um, how much of that ends up in the new fruit set? Is that an effect? You know, these, these things aren't measured. And I think, you know, while we as farmers are sorting out the pressures we're putting on ourselves, I think that's something that the industry needs to get, you know, some clearance on, on what are they actually focusing in the, um, the research on, you know, is there enough discipline in actually measuring throughout the process, you know, a phenology type of graph, what happens to MRLs, what happens to, you know, uh, phosphoric acid, and I think that's that's something that I can say Quibus is doing a lot of effort with, but I think it should be more companies getting involved, testing their own products, testing the movement of that, and from my side, I can say, if we have the orchards running, um, anyone that wants to get on board, get on board. I mean, Quibus is, is mentioning it. Let's look at the combination of different products or the benefits of specific products, perhaps in p specific areas of the phenol phenology. So that's my suggestion. Uh, we, uh, I, I heard Quibus said we shouldn't tree the sick trees, but the idea of injection is not to treat the sick trees, is, is to pr prevent the, the alpha trees from getting sick. And uh, it's uh, still early days, but what, we f we what, what I can say that we found that you should inject as soon as you harvest your, your crop, and then you, uh, you will be safe. I'm sure of that. Right. Any more comments? Davi, excuse me. I could hear you. Skip. Your stem draw like a. Our real guy. It's not a problem. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Um, then. Yeah. Okay. Um, then I think next up, uh, my dad with fertilizer requirements and a few fertilizer issues. Um, and yeah, after that, thank you. Yeah, I think w perhaps we should just mention, we're going to go a little bit over time. Um, I think we'll try and push it so that we obviously don't push it later than half past one. Um, but I think please just take note of it. Right. Uh, everything was on. This presentation is actually a quite lengthy one, but I'm not going to go into it in detail. This is a bit of a, a bit of a pirate that I've did here. When I dug into my canned fruit, is this thing now switch on or not? Okay. I've dug into my canned fruit and I got hold of this. Nutrition of Avocado edited uh, edition 2010 by Jara. And uh, I've re uh, built in a few of my own things in there, but not much. But I think this gives a very nice starting point. Now, if we go back to what uh, the title is, Maluma Fertilizer Norms and Practices, we, for the moment, are working on the HAS norms. And uh, to a certain extent, some of it has been adjusted. Uh, Bram Snyder sitting here did some work also and presented at least two papers on, uh, on uh, his observations and how it correlates with production and things. But I have no doubt we will have to go in depth and do it uh, for Maluma. And uh, it is a project that we will have to work on to find the exact uh, norms for uh, Maluma. Uh, there's a few basic things that you need to take into uh, account. I'm just going to go, I'm, I'm very going to be very brief. Uh, 
so yeah, in South Africa, I'll just, uh, the, some of the intros, I, I want to, do, uh, to, uh, to go through this. Fertilizing guide, uh, guidelines based on sampling of leaves, analysis and norms, soil analysis application based on phenological stages, growth cycle approach, that is South Africa. Very few fertilizer applications while tree establishment, foliar zinc boron application recommended monthly during the active shoot growth, especially in young trees. We know that is more or less the approach. Split nitrogen application recommended, caution for applying nitrogen too early. Nitrogen is an important uh, tool to manipulate vegetative and reproductive growth. Critical is, critical is overall nutrient management during the summer flush to uh, ensure uh, future productivity, then uh, physiological post-harvest food disorders. Yes, if we go wild with the nitrogen or the nitrogen-calcium ratios, we know that calcium is a key a nutrient to improve food quality. Now, <coughs> if we run through these things, uh, again, I'm going to be brief. If we look at the nutrient distribution, it's very interesting, and this is work, I think, Carol Lovat did, yes. Uh, in, 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 in nitrogen is basically uh, distributed fruits, leaf, branches, and roots, phosphorus located in the roots, uh, and the rootstock or the trunk, and uh, potassium is mainly located in the fruits and the branches. So then uh, if we go on, uh, if it has to do with your nat nitrogen calcium ratios, you know, those are things that, you know, people are working on, then uh, I want to go briefly through uh, the different elements here. Uh, nitrogen, yes, there's a, 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 the believes, you know, has to be 2.2 to 2.4, fewity, uh, I'm sorry, I've had to change this norm that I, th I think it's slightly lower for South Africa, that's not the South African norm there. And uh, uh, then the others, I've got it later on. There's a couple of things that's important, nitrogen has a great influence on growth and yield. And I think that's where we sometimes, particularly with Maluma, uh, what we've been doing is to cut back a little bit on nitrogen because of the fear of gray pulp. But we've, uh, through research, now discovered that gray pulp relates to the dead stone and the ability to ship it rock hard. Uh, if you take that out of the equation, there's definitely no gray pulp pr problem similar to, to Pinkerton, so you don't need to treat it as Pinkerton. Therefore, you can go on the nitrogen. If you go lower on the nitrogen, most certainly it's got you're going to... Uh, to uh, lose on production, and that we have proof of uh, in uh, in some of our blocks. Uh, <coughs> the norm is presently, as I said, 2.2 uh, to 2.4 roundabout. I'm fairly certain that we're going to discover that the norm might be slightly higher than 2.4 for Maluma, because it's very precocious, it is a productive cultivar, and if you want to set a good production, we one needs probably to work on a higher level. So. Uh, Obviously, uh, I'm going to allow questions on, on uh, or discussions on the, the different topics, uh, and obviously like to hear the opinion from uh, the floor. Then, um, if you go too high with nitrogen, there's always this danger of gray pulp, but it seems it's not a problem with Maluma. Yeah, in the past, where we, uh, we had uh, 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 gray pulp problems, I've mentioned you to what it related. I think what is important is that you know what your your fruit your yeah, your fruit uh, uh, nutrient levels are, and particularly nitrogen. If it's high in the fruit, you must realize, and you need to check that also in your ripening test that you do for maturity, or rather maturity testing moisture. Uh, you could see if the drop in moisture is too too uh, too high, you know, say at a one percent. Uh, and above, uh, you and it correlates also with the high nitrogen, you, you should know that you should harvest faster, otherwise you're going to sit with, with gray pulp problems. Now, just for the overseas guests, if we, uh, we in South Africa uh, like to do things the other way around, and I think we're the only industry in the world that talk of, of moisture. Now, now, what I've actually referred to is, uh, is dry matter. If your dry matter is, uh, if the dry matter drops, or inc uh, the dry matter increases by more than 1%, and your nitrogen in the fruit is high, uh, then there might be a danger of gray pulp. Right, nitrogen, uh, uh, the absorption of nitrates, avocados like nitrates, not ammonium. Then there's a deficiency symptoms. Here's phosphorus uh, symptom, uh, uh, potassium. There's not much being said about phosphorus for the moment. We tend to, uh, to have 
Uh, what I can mention is that our soils tend to be low in uh, phosphorus, but our, uh, our leaf uh, values are usually within in the norms. And uh, I, I don't think we t take a uh, uh, lot of attention to, uh, to phosphorus, except that we do a pre-enrichment as, you know, with Maluma as with all the others. Uh, pre prior to planting, potassium is an important element. Uh, deficiency symptom here. Then calcium, I'm just going to go through these just... Uh, 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 you know, the, the I didn't want to go in too much detail on the calcium thing. I'm oh, sorry, the potassium. I want to go in a little bit more detail on the calcium. Calcium is a very important uh, element, uh, and uh, the absorption of it, as we know, is fairly slow. And there's a particular time that you need to look at it. You we you know that the the the, the, the flesh and uh, things could be affected if your calcium is too low. It's this it's basically the building, building of your strength. We know that, uh, uh, you know, there's the beliefs that if your uh, calciums are too low, you will end up with, uh, with anthrax nose, vascular browning, pulp spot, uh, flesh discoloration, rapid softening, ripening. So if you want to extend ripening uh, and softening, you could increase your calciums to a certain extent, so, uh, then uh, susceptibility to chilling industry and uh, sorry, not industry injury. Then uh, I'm doing it the other way around here. Calcium-related disorders are also internal calcium distribution problems, mainly be between mature and growing regions of the plant in and or in the fruit. So we know calcium is a bit of a slow mover, but we know that we need to take attention of it. Now, uh, uh <coughs> if, if you look at the calcium cycle, I'm not going to go in much detail here. This is a cal calcium cycle that Wiley did work on. Then uh, this is very interesting, calcium concentration in avocado fruit. And it is actually important, you know, that you should attend to your calcium applications. Uh, it, uh, you know, the, it says the critical period for calcium management is the first 11 weeks of the fruit set. Uh, and I think sometimes we, we neglect that. Then uh, calcium and cold damage. Uh, calcium movement in the fruit to the distal end is fairly slow. So that's why... Uh, the cold damage tends to manifest itself at the at the bottom if we get this uh, frost damage in the orchard frost damage or maybe in transit but the orchard frost damage we know it's at the bottom usually then calcium and fruit quality uh, you know the we know that it relates uh, or, uh, uh, it correlates higher in calcium better fruit quality calcium and uh, fruit quality also I think this has to do with anthracnose yes uh, then uh, uh, calcium efficiency varies with root stocks. Now this is, I wanted to put this up, uh, this is, uh, yes, I, this you could see Wiley there. This is a firm belief in, um, in uh, 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 Australia that if you use Valvi compared to Duke 7, that you get a better uptake of calcium. Uh, I, in the one trial that I've, we've done, I took leave analysis of each rootstock, and it, it, it consists of uh, Valvik, Bounty, Dusa, and uh, has on its own roots, uh, and GE755. I couldn't find any significant difference. Uh, so this is debatable, but still, we're talking of another variety, and I think this needs to be checked with, with, uh, with um, Maluma, the variability from tree to tree, uh, then the deficiency symptom, uh, uh, magnesium, d typical deficiency symptom. Sulfur, uh, sulfur. Sometimes people confuse sulfur with nitrogen. Sulfur moves slow in a plant. Deficiency symptom therefore manifest in the younger leaves. So if you typically would get hardened of uh, 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 twigs or branches or whatever, the uh, hardened of leaves actually, the older leaves will be beautifully green and the young leaves will be slightly smallish. Uh, and this typical yellow color, and that usually relates to calcium. To correct it is very easy. You could, you could correct it with gypsum. You could correct it, obviously, if your pH allows for it, ammonium uh, sulfate, and there's other products also that you could use. Right, boron. There's the interesting two buggers. We'll get to the zinc also. Uh, the need of boron, we know it's a very important uh, fertilizer. A boron or nutrient rather, and boron is required prior to the flowering for proper fertilization and fruit set. Foliar application of boron is not enough. Uh, we know it doesn't work that well. Uh, uh, we try to do soil applications, and the, uh, soil applications can be so extremely efficient that it could have toxic effects, so you need, need to know what you're doing there. 
a Lanzuola application should be complemented with Foley application before fruit set where need is the highest. Now some of us, what we do is we spray uh, uh, zinc and boron during flower uh, because we believe there's a good uptake there. There was some work done on that and uh, it was definitely not confirmed with Maluma. Boron soil applications, uh, that all again the two rootstocks, again the old story that uh, Valvik, Valvik's uptake is better. Uh, I couldn't confirm this with our own trials. Then um, a critical level for deficiency, uh, there's certain critical levels. If you go below 25 milligram per kilogram, you're going to end up with serious boron deficiencies. And we know that boron is a very important element for pollen tube growth. So therefore, uh, whatever the norms would be, uh, I have no doubt that we need to manage uh, Maluma within at least the norms uh, are similar to the other cultivars. And as you know, it's only nitrogen that uh, we have differences between different cultivars. The other elements is basically the same. So between uh, uh, this again is, is the Australian one, 40 to, uh, to 100. We work to 40 to 80 parts per million. Then uh, uh, this is also a very interesting uh, uh, side, and I think we need also to confirm this, that uh, has is moderate susceptible, fewity, uh, moderate tolerant, and highly susceptible shower. We need to see where Maluma fits in here. Uh, you know, where it relates also to, uh, to the rootstocks. So um, then, uh, uh, yes, uh, we have got soil deficiencies. Uh, uh, leaf boron concentrations were uh, also directly correlated to increasing fruit size. So if you have a fruit size problem, uh, boron uh, has an effect on fruit size. Uh, this, I don't know if it's ever been confirmed also with, uh, with, uh, well with Maluma, most certainly not, and we haven't got a fruit size problem. It, uh, f as far as myself is concerned, we tend to focus more on zinc if it comes to, uh, to fruit size with uh, with uh, with uh, uh, with our has fruit, particularly the roundishness, boron deficiency, uh, very severe, uh, critical levels, toxicity levels above uh, uh, tw uh, 90 parts per million. Uh, uh, the avocado is sensitive, is sensitive to irrigating water containing more than 92 parts per million. Toxicity symptoms get visible in the the plant uh, with a uh, uh, no, that's not uh, parts per million. It's parts per billion there. Uh, and uh, uh, then uh, toxicity symptoms get visible in the plant with boron concentration levels at uh, 100 microgram per kilogram. This is also in the billions, am I right? Uh, that's milligram. Uh, milligram. Uh, that it can't be microgram. Yeah, they, they must be milligram per kilogram. Yeah, yeah, it can't be microgram. It's milligram per kilogram, and that would be parts per million. Right, uh, didn't pick that up. Then uh, over application of boron leads to toxicity. There you are, uh, micro, uh, a milligram per, ki per kilogram soil. Uh, if you over apply, you're going to look for trouble, and uh, you just follow the normal norms as for the other cultivars. Then uh, over supply of boron leads to toxicity uh, uh, symptoms again here. Yeah. Uh, if we look at folio boron on the one side and uh, uh, level of the solution uh, uh, is mi microns, you know, I must say, I think I'm going to skip this one. Uh, I, I uh, you know, that one, I've, I, I must say I didn't interpret it now properly. So skip it. Uh, uh, copper deficiency, uh, yes, that's how it looks. We, we, uh, we don't really see it because we spray a lot of copper, iron deficiency, manganese deficiency, right here we with zinc. Uh, zinc sulfate is a soil application, zinc sulfate in irrigation. Uh, I must say, uh, uh, I don't think we get the results with zinc s sulfate, uh, you know, typically you know, in a banded uh, uh, application. I, I'm fairly certain people are getting a better, better results with uh, zinc s uh, sulfate used uh, in irrigation as a part of irrigation. Uh, it's also open now for debate when we get to that point. So, you know, I just want to run through it fast here. Application of zinc increase leaf zinc status. You could see the control and zinc sulfate via the soil. You could definitely increase your, your uh, zinc levels. Uh, 
but uh, how you do the application, again, I don't believe that the, the uh, banding or whatever works. You know, this little heap that you pile up below your micros. I, uh, I'm not comfortable that it works. Deficiency symptoms, uh, uh, you know, the, the mottled leaves. I've got a, a, a nice uh, slide here. Uh, I just want to say the optimum leaf zinc concentration there again. Uh, it must be above 30. Uh, mainly occurs in calcareous soils. Right, there's typical uh, zinc deficiency symptoms. Uh, another one, uh, nutrition of avocados, other effects, uh, salt uh, toxicity. We haven't got many areas. Uh, Mucatia has got some of this. Typical tip burn that you could see. On the left-hand side, that's chlorine. On the right-hand side, that's sodium. Then uh, I think this we must remember. We sometimes see these symptoms, and then we uh, cannot explain it. And uh, I think we must, in such instances, particularly in nurseries, check our sodium. Right. Uh, then uh, yeah, the analysis. We all know this. The third leaf, leaf from the knuckle, uh, and it's, uh, there mustn't be any fruit on it, and it's uh, your... Uh, your uh, uh, spring hardened off spring flush, uh, but the, 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 the whole flush must be hardened off. Third one from where the knuckle is, and the knuckle is actually where, uh, where the, uh, the inflorescence uh, were the previous year. And uh, leaf samples taken in April, May, we know all this. Then uh, this is the different norms for different countries, Australia, California, New Zealand, South Africa, Mexico. You could just uh, briefly go through there, but you could see we all run around about 2.2 to 2.4. Some countries run slightly higher on the nitrogen, and uh, you know, basically more or less in uh, the same uh, uh, range. Some of the countries do not take uh, uh, spring leaves. Uh, they uh, would uh, analyze uh, summer leaves. I think Australia is one of them, and uh, that has been a big debate years ago. That was a big, big debate. Right nutrition at the right time. Obviously, this is important. Uh, the fruit size of avocado is higher related to the number of cells than the cell size in fruit. This is quite an interesting uh, uh, remark here that fruit size of the avocado higher relates to the number of cells and, uh, than the cell size. Now, I think it's Blackie Schwartz that uh, part of his master's degree uh, did uh, work on uh, you know, that cell division keep continues as long as the fruit hangs on the tree. And then, uh, 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 so it will never stop. And then you will then get, obviously, a cell enlargement. So I think this probably also where this comes from, that <coughs> cell division uh, increases the size of your fruit. Uh, it's actually a very interesting remark, but, uh, uh, and I don't know if it's been checked. You know, when we sit with small fruit, uh, if it's... Uh, if it's been checked, you know, the number of cells per a, a particular square area. And uh, because we know that climatic conditions could affect your uh, fruit size also, it's not, not necessarily re related to, to a nutrient. It is important to maximize cell division in, uh, in fruit during the first seven to eight weeks of fruit set. This is very, very important. Then the two key trace elements involved in the process are zinc and boron. Good. That is basically my story to this point. So I've went as fast as possible through this so that we could just spend time and I could go back. So my intention was not to say to you, this is how we should uh, fertilize Maluma because we're still doing it according to the Hass norms, but there is a tendency towards lifting the nitrogen slightly higher. Now, I think I want to open this first as, uh, you know, to discuss. Uh, uh, I don't know, Pete, uh, if, uh, if you would like to uh, remark, you know, on to what extent is the, uh, because your production on your malumas, uh, I know is good year on year, uh, to what extent do we uh, have to apply slightly more nitrogen? Is the has norms good enough or not? Uh, Andre, no, I, t I think I told you before that I use the hash norms. I use 2.3 as my as my aim for fertilizer application. For that's now for nitrogen. For nitrogen, yes. In the other elements, are you comfortable that for the moment we 
we stay with, uh, you know, the norms as for the other cultivars. That's now zinc and bowden in particular. And uh, uh, yes, let's stick to that first. Yeah, zinc and bowden, uh, 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 zinc is a little bit of a problem to get it up. Mm. At some stage, I got it up quite high, but then it dropped again. Now I'm battling to get it up again. Bowden is not so difficult. We can get it up. And, and I think it's, it's, it's for the plant health. And, uh, well, for the rest, the potassium and the calcium, uh, we try to balance the soil, and we believe that if the soil is balanced, uh, the absorption of those nutrients will be sufficient for the plant growth. But as long as we sit with a high magnesium content of a high pH, it's a, bi it's a big problem. So if you d d it can't help, you don't help to add more and more and more and in increase the concentration in the soil if it's not in able to absorb. Um, to apply zinc and boron, uh, but let's talk of zinc first. Your opinion about this banded application and uh, doing it uh, uh, fertigation-wise? Uh, no, when, when I got started at VT2, there was also the idea of putting it in a little hole. Mm. But you can s think for yourself, the, the salt concentration in that area, I don't think any root will go near there. So uh, I don't think it's a good thing. My, my reasoning, I, I we do it every time we irrigate, we almost every time we irrigate, we apply zinc. Uh, zinc sulfate. I, I, I'm using zinc nitrate because it's easy to use. It's a liquid. Uh, zinc sulfate som sometimes have a problem to get dissolved. So it's not easily dissolved. But I'm using zinc nitrate and uh, so as I said, I, I got it up, but now in a lately I'm I'm close to 30, mm. 30, just above 30. I never I, I have been up to 50, 60, but I don't know. Um. Then uh, uh, the boron? The boron also I apply, we apply l small quantities. Uh, wh what? Uh, every, time, every time we fertilize, so one kilogram per hectare or something like that. What, what, uh, what do you apply? Uh, uh, we use spray balls. Uh, big pardon? Spray balls. Spray balls, yes. Yeah, and, and you're comfortable with that? And uh, as far, you know, I agree with it. To, uh, to lift your boron levels is not that difficult. Uh, b uh, it could drop very fast. You yeah, know, yeah, you yeah, need yeah. to maintain it. But the zinc one is a damn difficult one. If you arrive there at the 100 parts a million, yeah. don't think now you can stay away and stop. Yeah. yeah. Because if you do that, you yeah. drop to, yeah. to rock bottom. Th that's one thing and uh, what I've also learned, and I'm going to give the floor a chance also, is that don't think if you add 100 that, that you could skip a year and say, right, I'm going to leave it out now uh, because I've got enough reserves. <laughs> it could drop very fast. That I've also as, as, uh, noticed. But the zinc is the problem to get up. I know it's difficult, and uh, I don't know, Peter. Is there any other remarks on that you would, you know, uh, in in, you know, uh, the the elements that we work hard on is is obviously uh, 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 nitrogen, zinc, boron. But the other one is also potassium. You know, maybe you could just give your remark on potassium if you don't mind. Well, uh, we at ZVT we we believe in balancing the soil, mm. so we we try to bring the potassium up to seven percent of the cation absorption. Mm, mm. And, uh, and if it's there, there will be enough. Yeah, but uh, so there's a, a potassium r uh, reserve basically in the yeah, soil. Yeah, in the soil, because mm. uh, if, you if you get it to 7% of the, mm. of the, of the uh, uh, cations, there's a lot of potassium in the soil. Thanks, Pete. So then you only need root growth. So good healthy roots mm -mm. to get good absorption of yeah. calcium yeah. and potassium. Uh, maybe uh, uh, while you you uh, taking the floor, uh, uh, I think what you said, uh, boron and zinc, basically with uh, with irrigation you apply it. Now, w would you do any winter applications? Uh, w we don't apply any fertilizer June, July. It's too cold. July. June and July. Yeah, the other months you would apply we until would rain apply. starts. Yeah, yeah and you try and fit your annual annual uh, amount in uh, during you know the irrigation period. Is, is yeah, that right? we. We, f I, 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 I'd like to do a, a weekly basis, but then mm. you, you get in trouble with the rain. Yes. So you cannot irrigate right. every week. Yeah. So, yeah. Then, so then we yeah. go. We now we go for pl uh, two weekly. Basis. If it rains, do you go in by hand application, or do you see? That's we we do hand application. I'm not very fond of hand application. Yeah. 
because of the d s uh, lack of distribution. Yeah. Uh, I'm okay. going to look at other other ways to apply it. Uh, Modernite, which just has got some uh, slow slow release type of a function. Do you any do you co you consider no that? I've no, I've, I haven't considered a slow release. Okay, then uh, uh, with Zinc also with each application you apply. With each ap yeah. application okay. of fertilizer yeah. we apply. And yeah. with your potassium, do you uh, do one application or a split application? We uh, usually apply it four times per year. Yes, but also in irrigation. Through the irrigation, yeah. if possible. Yes. If if the quantities is too high, then we need to apply it higher. Yes, and uh, what uh, potassium sulfate? We use potassium yeah. sulfate. Yeah. Right. Uh, the floor. Uh, I'm go definitely going to ask Nico <laughs> to uh, for his remarks. So maybe Nico, I'm I'm picking people here, but I don't want to exclude anybody. You know. Uh, 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 Nico, I know you've got a lot of experience. Yes, uh, there's one thing that I skipped, the, the, the calcium. Nico, the, uh, the floor is still yours. Calcium, uh, do you agree with, uh, with the application of calcium? And uh, I think we all, uh, you know, we aim for calcium nitrate, uh, basically within that first, say, 10, 11 weeks after, after food set. Is that also your belief? No. Uh, like I said, said previously, we try to balance the soil. On uh, the lighter soils, we improve the yep. increase the calcium concentration of the cations to 70 percent. Yes. And in the in the heavier soils to 75. That's now calcium. Remember, calcium. Yeah. C A. Yeah. Okay. So uh, you know this is a I very important remark. And we use uh, we use gypsum. Uh, yes. And and uh, calcitic lime. So your you if your soil calcium is within the norm, and your potassium. Uh, uh, is within a certain norm, yeah. you do not add additional, say, during that, uh, so let's mm. call it fruit set period, now calcium we uh, in particular. We do, we do, we do apply uh, uh, sprays yes. of calcium. Yes. At an early fruit set when okay. the fruit is still small. Okay. It's a very interesting, uh, uh, personally, you know, I'm also one of those believers that I won't just go in blank and say, let's apply calcium nitrate. If the levels in the soil, we try to manage the levels within the soil. I nearly forgot the calcium one. Right. Yeah, and, and uh, I saw, saw you mentioned uh, nitrate. We don't apply nitrate. Uh, uh, a calcium nitrate. No, uh, yeah. a nitrogen fertilizer. Uh, okay, I see. What do you apply then? We apply ammonium sulfate. Okay, but you want to bring the pH down? No, you, you don't bring your yeah. pH down. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's a, that's also a story. I the yeah. a lot of people told me. I yeah, but ammonium gets converted. To yeah, to but if yeah. there's enough calcium in your soil and there's yeah. enough potassium and magnesium, yeah. where will the hydrogen go? Yes. Okay, that's a nice one. Right now, Nico, now you could turn everything on its head. Okay. Yeah, there's a question. Can you just repeat that calcium level? Seventy, seventy-five percent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but wh while you're referring to that, what I, I found is yes, uh, we also try to manage it more or less at that level. But sometimes you get that uh, you know the ratio between it's ca it would be then uh, a calcium, potassium. Uh, you know that the others do. You know sometimes they're not there although there's enough reserves in the soil, do you bother that th th they need to be in a certain percentage? Or with the, you know, say calcium 75 or 70 and above? Do yeah. you understand what no, I mean? We, we, uh, we, I will not like to go much much higher than 75. Yes, but I know I've, 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 we've got some places where the people apply extra ca lime, uh, not gypsum, and then it goes yeah. up to 80%. And that's not uh, yeah. not good for me. But uh, if you if you have your s your calcium at seventy five, your ca potassium yeah. at seven, the rest can be anything. Yes, but all right, but uh, that's right. But let's say uh, uh, let's say it happens that uh, the potassium is slightly lower than the seven percent, but uh, your uh, 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 the, the the actual uh, 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 potassium in your soil. A, a per se cubic per cubic meter is you know there is a reserve. Uh, does it bother you? You know the ab above the the soil norm. Does it bother you, bother you or not? No, we we try to get the balance. Yes. If in any 
always get the balance 75 7 yeah. and the rest yeah. is magnesium Ma yeah maybe m I, I didn't express myself correctly I, which one of those two would be the important one to have say at the normal slightly above the normal uh, no i think both of them both of them right okay um then um uh was nico nico body fluid yeah, Andre, I can't agree more with him. Pete, I think he knows also most of the answers. But I think when you come back to the boron and the zinc situation, yes, both do have a role to play in fluid size. Uh, if you look at the role that they play in your cell division and cell elongation and energy movement in the plant, that's why you that they play a role in your fluid size. Um, I have numerous uh, examples, especially on zinc shortages, and where you see the, uh, the, the, the fluid size and whatever the moment you start picking it up. And, and the problem is, okay, boron is easy to apply to the soil. It's one of the easier ones to apply and get absorption through the system. Where zinc is very difficult. But uh, as Andre said, you know, apply zinc sulfate, whatever, you can just as well apply that to the tar root because that's the effect you will get. Because they get bound to the soil particles so fast that the tree just can't absorb it. So if it's not chelated, or most properly in the form of nitrate, because the nitrate pulls it up, and it's the, ni the negative charge of the nitrate that pulls it up, and and that it and that's why it's best to apply it frequently in short uh, 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 amounts, uh, like you know ev every irrigation. That then you will start get your uh, benef uh, benefit uptake. But it must must be either chelated product, or you can chelate it with organic acids, or you can use zinc nitrate. Uh, but just apply zinc sulfate, you waste your time totally. Um, yeah, uh, again on the cation balances, I think very important. Uh, the type of soil as well that you have. If you have sandy soils, you must realize you can go lower on your balances, especially on your calcium, uh, because the, the cation exchange capacity of the soils is much lower. To, uh, and, and, and that also means that nutrients are actually more available there. Um, but uh, it's very important to have that the p a potassium at 7. I think that's very important. But uh, I hate to get my actually my calcium to 75 because that suppresses my magnesium again. And we, we saw that... Your magnesium must be above 15 to 20. I don't like it more, really more than 20, because we must realize mm. magnesium plays a very big role in the energy uh, 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 um, buildup uh, for the energy to, to uh, of your plant. So if your plant doesn't have that energy, you know, it's also going to lack uh, uh, pr pr uh, productivity. So that's why we, we need those balances in the soil. And so the only negative one is the soda. So. Um, try to get those things, uh, your potassium at 7, magnesium between 15 and 20, and I would say, uh, like a previous speaker says, between 68 and 72, 73, maximum 75, I don't really like it that high, uh, and then you're fine. Um, and uh, yeah, I think the, the most important thing is, is to apply fertilizer small amounts as frequent as possible. I think we must get away, and as uh, Zander said about the multi-coat, that thing mimics basically an open hydroponic system. And that's how we should start moving our fertilizer. Small amounts, as constant as possible, and we will get away from <coughs> uh, this <coughs> shock effects. Those shock effects is also uh, have a shock effect in the soil because we have shock effects of, of salinity in the soil. Every time we apply 500 grams of potassium sulfate, LAN, whatever we apply, ammonium sulfate, whatever, there's a shock effect in the system. And we, we burn roots, we damage roots. And what happens? We bring in phytophthora. So, um, and that's what I saw with, with the multi-coat on a, on a land which was uh, a, a mature tree, which uh, really it's bad soil and you shouldn't uh, actually plant an avocado there. And uh, if you go and look at those trees, they don't even have phytophthora, they do get even treated with phytophthora. But I think the soil is of such a nature, not even phytophthora want to live there. But, uh, um, it's, but it just shows you, you can take the, uh, the stress from the root system by improving your, uh, fit, uh, your fertilization and your uh, irrigation. We can go a long way of, of, of keep, keep our trees healthier and more precocious and full of energy. So that's what I want to say. Um, Nico, in your multi-coat, where you uh, incorporate zinc and boron, uh, particularly zinc, what, uh, at what formulation? Yeah, we, it, it's incorporated, but it's uh, they are more slow releasing and control release because they sulfur coated, so they're not uh, polymer coated like the rest. Yeah. Yes, and but w uh, and what formulation would the zinc be? What do you use? Uh, it, well, uh, the, the formulation is unfortunately zinc sulfate, but it's amazing that we <laughs> it, it, it in that because it gets uh, uh, released in such small amounts, and I think because of the roots, 
that yeah. encapsulates itself mm -hmm. around the root. Uh, uh, that actually yeah. the, the effectivity of the uh, uh, fertilizer to the root or that 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 that, that, that movement is so effective that you actually uh, pick it up, which is amazing. But mm. it, it does it does work that way, yeah. even in a sulfate yeah. form. But it just shows you how healthy roots or how important that mm. is to utilize your fertilizer. Um, maybe a, a nice topic for uh, for uh, let's say the next Maluma day is to say. Uh, yes, I on paper, a fertigation is a fantastic thing. It is fantastic. We all need to go that route. And it's been said also here. But the problem is that we sit with the summer rainfall where in some areas here in Zinin, they had in uh, Zinin up there actually in Polizzi, apparently had over a thousand uh, millimeters in the, in the during the month of February. Now, um, that is one, uh, uh, we've been uh, fertigating on the one farm and it became a nightmare that uh, with the bananas, it's okay, you apply. Bananas likes a lot of water, but with avocados, when the trees are young, you could get away. But at some stage, there's a cutoff point and then you're going to start losing uh, your roots and things. And it might be a, that's one thing that I would like to know more about and I don't think we've got the time today is to say, which of the non-rainy months, you know, I like what Pete said, June, July, they do not apply, and then the other months, and would that be sufficient, particularly if we refer now to zinc and boron, zinc in particular. Uh, I must say what we, with our high-density trials, I don't know if Zander said it, but, you know, we are uh, working now with multi-coat. We don't want to go uh, through uh, in, uh installing, you know, uh, the whatever's to do uh, drip uh, uh, fertigation to do the drippers. For the moment, the reaction we get is extremely good. Although I'm a bit worried, I told you that we need to increase the zinc and boron a little bit in the, in the mix, but they do it themselves. We will report on that in, uh, in future. Right. I'm going to allow one, uh, I think I'm going to do, uh, this will be going to be the last question, then we just jump to the next topic. No, sorry, I think Zonda um, asked for some more comments from our side. I couldn't agree more with you. I think um, w when it comes to cation ratios, Peter summed it up beautifully. It's all dependent on CEC. If you go into sandy soils, I'm talking very sandy soil CECs of two and below, then parts per million obviously becomes a critical factor. Whereas if you go up to high clay soil CEC, then percentages and relations. What I want to comment actually is that um, um, we sort of, sort of have a, a, a nice issue with <coughs> phosphorus or phosphates in the sense that we know at high pHs they get complexed organically or by calcium and then they become inavailable as well as by at low pHs with aluminium and hydrogen. So we, m we see very often in soils at critical pH levels um, amongst others that uh, phosphates, uh, although we keep applying autophosphates, they do not show up within the within the um, leaf analysis sometimes or even the soil analysis. So we tend to now focus on polyphosphates, which is basically a chain linked of, of autophosphates, highly uptakeable, um, the same stuff that ATP molecule is made up of. So, so we tend to focus on that and we can get into the details afterwards as well. And then I think, I, I think we just have to exaggerate a bit again on the biology. Um, and I'm pretty sure everybody is familiar with mycorrhiza. If you go and Google mycorrhiza and see the ability of that fungus to extract phosphorus from the from the soil matrix and get it up into the plant direct, almost like a, you can call it an intravenous sort of uptake system, getting energy into the plants, I think we should, going forward, um, try and focus on those guys as well. Um, not move away from applying because you need food in the pantry, but we also need to get keys for the pantry to open them up. And so that's just a few comments from my side as well, with biology again. Right. Uh, yes, I think Zana is going to cut us short. I just want to say we had Marianne Fenter, who is a, a mycorrhiza boffin, uh, doing trials in our nursery. And unfortunately, I think she ran out of a little bit of steam. We did see some results, and I think we need to repeat it. And uh, I... Uh, you know that you know we, uh, with this Maluma Day, we try and integrate uh, what we do on the farm and basically give the opportunity or what we apply on the farm, you know, the opportunity for, uh, for the different companies, in this particular case, the chemical companies, irrigation companies, to say uh, with Maluma, 
let's do a trials. And we, I've, I'm, not, I'm not a problem. That's how Nico arrived with his multi-coats and things. Uh, and, you know, then uh, the, the idea is that you people uh, do the manage the trial yourself as, uh, uh, what is the name from Prazin? Kurbas uh, uh, is doing from Prazin. And then eventually we could report on that. So, uh, in any case, I think Zana is going to cut me short now so to go to the next uh, topic. Okay. Um, yeah, just a quick um, explanation from my side about I'm not going to put a presentation on. We definitely running too far behind and I don't want to speak too much. Um, as you are aware, we do have a, a breeding and selection program. Uh, it's been running for a few years. And uh, the initial orchard had a few problems, um, but we relocated it um, to two different orchards. The one, fortunately, is next to my dad's house. So it's been getting a lot of atten attention. It's his Sunday afternoon golf round. So um, it really works well. And I think, you know, suddenly we also um, get more results. But what I want to mention on it is um, I think perspectives about new varieties have changed quite a bit, and we've discussed part of it, I've discussed it a lot. Um, but, you know, with that and rootstocks, rootstocks, it used to be all about Phytophthora and cultivars. Um, everything was getting as close as possible to Hess. And as you know, um, we totally against that. Um, first and foremost for us in terms of um, rootstocks, um, definitely uh, precocity. Um, I think a new few new things that might come up is drought-resistant rootstocks, um, and also perhaps something well-suited for high density. Um, so there's many new topics that we need to define, um, things that I perhaps don't even think of. And I think with fruit, um, obviously, um, it's about filling specific market gaps. But as I say many times, I don't think um, the market gaps will be there forever. We'll fill them pretty quickly. And I think the longer term objective is to find um, the new varieties, the new generation varieties. So you almost want to split the two where you have cultivars that fill the gap and you have cultivars that are the in there for the long run. So the cultivar that fills the gap isn't necessarily uh, the best cultivar um, in terms of, let's say, if in our opinion, something better than Maluma, but it has something that we can do. And I think. Over, over the years, a lot of cultivars were neglected, um, were thrown out of breeding programs purely because it wasn't a perfect cultivar. Even with ourselves, um, you know, being happy with Maluma's small seed, it's almost like you just want to look for uh, another fruit with a small seed. Um, but in the meantime, there's something that fills a specific market gap that you're not addressing. Or um, you're s testing things in specific localities and not testing it wider to actually see what, what it's doing. So the main objective basically is perhaps to revisit some cultivars in the next few years um, and retest them in different localities so that you see what happens, but also uh, to run a bit through what cultivars we currently have, um, what we do believe has potential for specific market gaps or whatever, but also a few interesting varieties. And I think one last comment that I want to make is obviously if the whole world plants Maluma, um, then uh, we might be back at a point that we ask maybe we should have some small fruit and then we're going to ask where's the next variety that's better than S. So in the same fruit count size. So and then you, you look again for something there, perhaps something with the exact same characteristics, but that produces better in a warm climate or whatever. So I think the different objectives are so wide that we need to look at everything and revisit a lot of things. Thank you. Right. Um, cultivars for the future, the available gene pool for the avocado industry. Now, um, it sounds a heavy topic, but this is more or less, I've done it as short as possible, seeing that, uh, uh, you know, this is actually a workshop. Now, characteristics of cultivars for the future, and we could add to the list, I've put down a couple there. Uh, what we see as new generation cultivars, it needs to be pre precocious. It must be productive. Tree shape and size, obviously uh, uh, suitable for high density. So it has to do with, with its shape. Uh, and we prefer 
that if you talk of uh, trellising in particular, that it uh, should be a central leader grower, but not necessarily meaning that uh, we will abandon or discard any, uh, any varieties that's not central leader ones. Then uh, fruit characteristics, skin thickness. You don't want a skin that you need to spray too much copper, so it's more of a copper resistant, uh, 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 sarcospora resistant uh, per fruit. Uh, the skin, oh, uh, there's a typo, typo, color. Skin color, uh, that's a new spelling. Uh, then uh, the flesh, you know, the f what is the flesh color? The green rin, that is also good to have. Uh, you don't want unnecessary stringent, uh, it must be stringent, is that string stringy? What is here, Engels? Uh, as these strings and you know, the vascular bundles that uh, makes little strings. Then uh, seed flesh ratio, that's also important to have a small seed. It uh, must store well. Shelf life, then, uh, and obviously it's taste and adaptability to climate. So that's just a few we could add to the list. So, uh, so uh, and obviously these characteristics and uh, many others are all, uh, you know, the nice thing is they, I, could, I want to use it with, uh, they are available in the June pool. We just need to discover them and slowly, slowly, through your breeding program, get them to, uh, to manifest itself in a particular cultivar. Now, unfortunately, gene uh, manipulation with avocados is still uh, something that we talk about, but it's not at the point that we could say it is successful. What is, uh, there's a lot of gene mapping that going on. Apparently, it's, uh, the Mexicans has mapped it but they do not uh, want to uh, to uh, make the maps available. Uh, I think they haven't, that's why they don't make it available. So uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, talking about this to map the different characteristics so that it's uh, possible through DNA that you could uh, do your fingerprinting and say, this that gene is here through breeding, it might come to the surface. But breeding is still very conventional and uh, the results could be very slow. But I can say what we've done at Alice Best is we've planted, it's the traditional thing, you plant a lot of has seed and you go through the exercise and evaluate them one by one. It's a big effort. I do believe, however, that in this world, uh, if you look at uh, the uh, uh, Bob Berg selections, I think there's a couple of them lying there, they're on a shelf, and nobody took them and commercialized them. Uh, we're busy now with rootstocks. Whatever rootstock could come our way, we trial them as you've seen. And uh, I believe that we need to s uh, just relook what is already available as part of your breeding and selection program. Right. Alles best the breeding and selection program. Uh, then uh, as an integrated breeding and selection approach. Uh, 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 but you what you do is you take seedlings uh, of your top has producers, plant them out, that's phase one. Then you could uh, take uh, some of those seeds off the phase one and again produce seedlings of that. Uh, the best, uh, 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 the, the, the ones that comply or have certain characteristics that you feel you could build on or uh, has a potential, as a potentially uh, new cultivar selection or whatever, uh, the best selections will then be topped onto uh, uh, stumps uh, or top worked, top worked or topped uh, on a suitable on a suitable rootstock. Go uh, in as phase two. Again, you could take seeds off there and redo the whole thing. Then uh, the successful ones in in phase two evaluation, and that's smallish blocks. You've got about five to ten trees crafted, but you need to do it, and uh, it is 100% true. The seedling characteristics which you see. Uh, will not necessarily remain exactly as is as a seedling. As soon as you graft it, there could be a change. You could uh, see an increase in fruit size, but some of the characteristics come stronger to the surface if you do the grafting. So uh, then you could have your phase three, uh, and that is where you plant a semi-commercial block. If you're a Peruvian, you do 3,000. If you're South African, you probably would do 200. But you need to establish at least an hectare. <coughs> and obviously, uh, you need to work closely with the commercial side, 
you need to uh, uh, to evaluate and nowadays ripe and ready i forgot to put that as a characteristic the uh, uh, evenness of ripening uh, ripe and ready is the way to go so uh, you uh, want a variety that ripens well then if the good ones in phase three you could commercialize then chance seedlings we've got one that we think is going to make it uh, be wide and awake about ch chance seedlings they are there sometimes it's just a rootstock that grew out and it's of some value right and then you could also import material this uh, i told you there's a lot of material that i think we need to revisit again one of them that i believe need to be revisited is is uh, is gwen uh, gwen uh, was selected as a green has Bob Berg spent almost his whole life to get the green ass because he was instructed that has the, uh, the people doesn't want to buy black skin fruit because they believed it was fraught. And then um, he developed the Gwen, dabbed it after his wife, and then it was just put on the shelf. We have the material. We need to to reevaluate. Okay, right. What came out of, out of our trials? <coughs> you know, the rejections you get unbelievably funny things remember the gene pool in the avocado is extremely big and you've got the three races and uh, this it's huge it's huge uh, if you take has seed for instance which is a mixture uh, of uh, it's a, cro a cross between uh, uh, it's got Mexican some Mexican and some Guatemalan blood in it and then you get all these things popping out you don't see a, a, a any West Indian uh, uh, you know sort of uh, what do you call it that it, it, it slashes back to uh, to uh, to uh, to uh, uh, West Indian type, but most certainly Guatemalan and West and and, uh, and Mexican. Right. This is the trial block that Zander referred to. <coughs> We've got a uh, lot of selections. You could see the numbers there. Uh, here's my Sunday golf course. Right. Let's run through. <coughs> out of this trial, four green skins. Uh, sorry, two green skins came out. A one B, W one. These numbers uh, means nothing, and obviously you need to work with numbers uh, so that when you start protecting it, nobody should uh, blame you that you, uh, uh, you, you know, the novelty status has uh, been uh, whatever. Uh, both of them, could you could see, has got a fairly nice smallish uh, uh, seed. This W1, uh, you'll see at the end I've got a graph. This one I'm very, very, very positive about. It's got a fantastic taste. It crops well. It's not a central leader, but it is. Uh, it has definite, definite potential. You'll see why I say that. Then uh, here's W1. Uh, I've, I've got a better graph at the end. Uh, the blue line is has, so it's lighter than has if it's, it's if it's at the top. Just for the uh, uh, for the uh, visitors, is that again we work on moisture. So the higher the moisture, the lower the dry matter. So uh, uh, later than has, uh, this one is more or less the same as has. Uh, that is the two green skins. Here's the dark skins, Q19. Uh, this H1F2, uh, we've already sent fruit to, um, uh, to uh, 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 Nova Sun evaluated it for us. This one on a blind uh, test that we did uh, at our office came out, uh, uh, what can I say, neck, neck on neck with the Maluma. It's uh, got a fantastic taste and it's got a fantastic count distribution. It, is, uh, it, uh, it peaks on around about 16, 18 and it's very even and it crops heavily and it's dot on uh, the has and it's got a very shiny skin. The thickness is good. Uh, stone sometimes a little bit, you know, as you see, it's not that small, but this uh, a cultivar has got a very high potential. Then uh, O3, uh, O3 is one that, uh, you know, remember these, uh, 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 if you, s uh, you know, to sp spot the size, just look at the tag at the bottom. The tag, all those tags are the same size, so although O3 looks big, O3 is very small. That is the small one that we'll keep in the bank one day when we want to go back to small fruit. But this one is a light variety. Uh, O2B, I, uh, uh, O2, this O2B is one that's sticking up. This is a very interesting variety. You could see also it's got the shiny skin. It looks very, very, very similar to uh, H1. Very. It's very shiny. Stone is slightly bigger, but it's definitely not the same. But this one, 
Uh, I'll hopefully be able to confirm this here, but this one seems to be early. It seems to be uh, uh, coinciding with, with Fioti. And if that is the case, then you'll hear me jumping over this, uh, the roof here. Uh, mm? Yes. Yeah, but next year the number might be something different. <laughs> now you can write it down, uh, Pete, we can communicate. Uh, we, uh, we'll have to try it. This F1, uh, uh, don't bother about this one. C1 is also very interesting. This looks like a Fiat. It's got a thin skin like Fiat, but it's black. It's very precocious. And uh, uh, you could see the, it's the red line there. You could see drops below the, 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 the has. And uh, I've picked the fruit the other day and ripened it. And I tell you, let's see, I think it's going to be a black uh, fiorty, uh, not on with fiorty. I It's early days. Uh, this F2 is an incredible. This is a, a central leader. Those of you, you know that uh, I, we, I thought we would have time to go through yesterday, uh, but we couldn't. But at any stage, if you visit us, feel free. You, I can go. And I could take you go to go and have a look. Now this F2, slightly later. It's uh, that doesn't mean much. It's not that much later. Its uh, uh, fruit size is on the larger side. It is got a s it's got a central leader, but it's got stronger laterals. You'll be able to grow it without the trellising. You know, it won't drop like the Maluma is doing. You know, the, the droopy uh, branches. Maybe we wouldn't like it for this. Uh, this is F3, it's not too bad, slightly big stone, taste is good. Uh, Q13, yeah, I don't want to say too much about it. This W4 is a beaut. This is a beaut. This one, it sets on every flower, practically speaking, on every flower. It will drop some of them, but it's, it, it sets unbelievably well. Uh, it's been affected by, uh, th th we had more drop this year uh, th th on this season's fruit than last year. Uh, been affected by the dry, dry, uh, dry spell that we had. Uh, I believe this variety, uh, it's, it, it, it's, it, it's not as small as has, but it's smaller than, than, uh, than uh, Maluma. I, in the beginning, was a bit worried that the fruit size won't be good enough. So I don't know. Uh, fruit size might be uh, might be a, s a slight problem on this one, although it doesn't go that small. But I uh, it would peak around about from 18 to 22. I would like it to be slightly bigger. Right then, Q22. Originally, I was very comfortable with this one. I thought it is light. It tends to take long to color color up, but uh, I don't think it's going to make it. Q23 is an interesting one. This is one that I wanted to name uh, Gem, you know, because it looks like a Gem Squash, but that name has already been taken. You could see it's late. It's, uh, I, I, I think it would have novelty status. The taste is good. Uh, DA8 is a definite late cultivar, definite late. Uh, stone is a little bit on the big side. Uh, I think we've got a better one than this. Uh, F5. Uh, I'll be in a position to evaluate it. I've got more fruit this year to evaluate. Then uh, D1. Uh, this is also not a bad variety. It looks very, very similar to has. Uh, the problem with it, it gets uh, 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 frost damage in the flesh. Uh, Turner has. This material came my way a couple of years ago, and uh, th uh, through the problems we had in our selection block, which is under referred to, I had to uh, abandon there and restart and do everything over. So I've lost a couple of years. Now, it unfortunately, inf affected Turner Haas. Now, Turner Haas has been selected by John Dorian in the Childers area. Wiley, together with Wiley, they've, uh, they've protected it, and, uh, and uh, it was selected for being having larger fruit. And uh, I can confirm it des definitely is a bigger big ass. It looks 100% like ass. It's like like you see with something like uh, Carmen, that you know it's it looks like a has. It's a has. The only difference, it is definitely got a bigger size. And it seems to me for the moment that it's slightly later than, than standard has. I will report on this further. 
I don't know you people, uh, uh, Zala, you, I don't know if you know anything, and, and uh, 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 Graham, do you know anything about Turner House, uh, you know, in in, uh, in uh, Australia? It's, it, you know, I know they've tried it up in uh, the Tablelands. I don't think it was that successful. Uh, uh, but, you know, normal places like Childers and so forth, fruit size-wise, uh, how does it coincide with Has? Have you got any experience on that? Uh, uh, sorry, uh, sh he's just bringing the mic. Thank you. Now, I uh, don't seem to be getting the fruit set up in Childers uh, in uh, North Queensland. Childers, it sets very well. Everything you said about there is exactly right for it. But in Western Australia, it's just too big. We have problems with Hass being a little bit big over in Western Australia anyway. Mm. We've had to uh, really, well, the Western Australians have had to retreat, retrain the supermarkets to accept the bigger fruit, which they have done, but uh, Turner House is just a little bit too big for them. But for this area, I think it'd be very good, extremely yes, good. Yeah, because we have this fruit, uh, we, we have a uh, small fruit problem. But in shoulders, how does it do there? It is bigger than the normal house, uh, crops very, very well. And uh, is it been reported that it's slightly lighter than us? Yeah, it seems to be a little bit. Uh, not, not that. A little bit, yeah. Okay, great. Let's see how it goes. Then, uh, where are we now? Yeah, there. Uh, we're about at the end now. Then on the left-hand side at the top is HMR. Uh, that's not Hans Berensky Research, by the way. I see this uh, HMR. <laughs> <laughs> uh, HMR. Uh, Maluma on the right-hand side. McQueen. This damn thing. I don't know where it comes from. And... Um, it's at, why we call it McQueen, is uh, it's on, uh, what is a Tuernam, McQueen, McQueen down in Kippersall? Bruce. Bruce McQueen. And I know, I think they would want to try and protect it and do further research. I don't know if they've handed it to, you, to you people uh, uh, at, at, at WTS, you know, to the search. And, you know, I think he's sitting on something that might be worth something. Uh, he gave me the fruit to just evaluate the fruit, but he didn't give me any material. You know, that's a nice thing. If you want to protect the variety to the extent that you're very scared that somebody will steal it, don't do anything with it and just hide it somewhere. Then nothing happens. Um, I, d I personally think I'm worried that uh, Stefan Keene brought me, I th it was T146 or something at one stage, and uh, which I grafted one tree, and it disappeared. And I think it, it ended up at, at Bruce. So I still think it <laughs> is probably one of those, but I don't know. So uh, I don't know, uh, to you, maybe one day, we c uh, you know, if you're in contact with him, we must actually follow it up. And through DNA, probably what we'll be able to, to, to discover, is, you know, where it comes from. But the tree, original tree comes from our nursery. So it must be a mutation. But I don't know where I've collected that material. So the only explanation I had is that I think the, uh, the graph stick that uh, uh, Stefan gave me ended up with him. Okay, then uh, Grace has... This is an uh, um, eternal uh, rootstock that grew out. Uh, I've got it, you know, but it's, uh, for some reason, we, you know, we do not uh, do much with it. Uh, it's not good to have that, where's this pointer, that little uh, open space at the, uh, uh, the far end is not good. Now, this HMR is a definite, definite light variety. It's got a, a th uh, the skin thickness is a bit on the thin side, but it's definitely light. And I'll show you. Uh, on a graph now. Uh, uh, it's a, it's a, a chance seedling. So I don't know what the mother is. Uh, right. There. Okay, look at the graphs here. Remember I showed you W1? W1 is the green skin. Now I've compared it here with, uh, I just want to press the right button. You'll see it's W1, Fiorty, Rhine, and Pinkerton. This is the Fiorty line. Uh, you know, the regression line you could see there. And there's the Pinkerton, and then the W1 continues. You could see it's, uh, it's, it, it would be in line with the Pinkerton. It would, be, it would fit in with uh, the timing of Pinkerton, so it would be a mid-season. But don't forget that Ryan is not a late cultivar. We just, it has just got the ability to hang late. Uh, and that I've, I've, I've done... Uh, done uh, moisture uh, uh, whatever analysis on it many times. 
we tend to start with it below 70% moisture or above 30% uh, dry matter. So, uh, so uh, we need to take this one out. It does well in the cooler climates, as far as ZZ2's upper farm, but we need something here. And uh, I very positive about this guy. Slightly on the big side, but I don't think it should be a problem. Uh, fruit quality is extremely good. Uh, then uh, the following one, this is the one that I wanted to show you. Uh, you could see this is Hass again. That is Lamp. And that is the, 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 the HMR selection. Now this selection, although you see there a slight difference, uh, right, uh, I've been typed, that is the last slide. So, um, yeah, we just made it. Um, that that uh, selection, uh, it only starts coloring up, you know, to become a dark, you know, it starts ripening and coloring up from August onwards. I am very certain that this uh, cultivar has, uh, is a light one and could fit into that light slot. It hang, the ability to hang unbelievably well, it could, uh, you could extend it, if you know, there could even be germination in the seed and it will set the next crop. And uh, uh, you could easily down a, a, a year with us in our, our property, hang it until uh, the end of January, even into, uh, um, into j uh, I've actually, uh, uh, we've been uh, picking it right through to February, but then the last ones you would pick with a root in it. The, the, uh, the uh, uh, although it's got a, a thin skin, there's no problem with anthrac nose. It's, it's got a very, very good storage line, very good. I've done a trial with it where I've stored some of it together with lamb bass. And the lamb bass, uh, and I've, I'm not talking still stored it, I've picked the lamb bass, it was round about November, both of them. Put it in the fridge, and only in January, uh, I've uh, you know I've ripened them, put them in the fridge. The the uh, uh, this particular HMR was still still uh, 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 edible. <laughs> the lamp house was totally grey. So uh, we're going to to uh, to top work trees now, and uh, start ev uh, evaluating it, you know, at the outlets and see how it goes. And uh, I. I believe uh, the taste is is slightly affected. It's not, uh, you know, that typically more of a nutty type of taste, but the oil content is not too high. It doesn't get rancid uh, towards the end, even when the roots get out. In the beginning, it's a sort of a pepper undertone, but later on, it's it's a beaut. We, uh, that's my, my uh, uh, out of season avocados that we eat at ours. So right, we done. Okay, I'm uh, just going, yeah. Sorry. Um, yeah, um, I'm not going to speak too much. I'm not going to ask questions because I think at least you'll be able to ask your questions during lunch. Um, just finally, um, a big thanks from my side for everyone that's st stuck through the workshops. Um, it's a valuable learning experience, both for us and yourself. Um, and really appreciate you guys attending um and working with us if anyone does I, i've mentioned the way that Quibus operates um uh, we appreciate that we encourage it um the farmers whoever if people want to do trials try and collaborate with the with the input suppliers and the input suppliers please try and work with the farmers um and do your trials um we welcome it and then um the final thing just before we leave um, the Maluma meeting was scheduled for 2 o'clock. Um, I think let's make it uh, 10 past 2 um, for the people that want to attend. Um, we're going to have it in the conference room, so it's just a bit more intimate. Um, so when I leave at, at lunch, um, I'll lead the way, and those of you that want